Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Mosley, and I co-direct the UNC Department of Psychiatry's uh, Philosophy and Mental Health Program with my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Gary Gala. Uh, we are very happy that you've joined us today for uh, a, a discussion of the scientific, ethical, and policy dimensions of suicide prevention. Uh, just say a little bit about uh, how we're going to proceed today. Um, the first portion of our program is going to begin discussing uh, some of the uh, basic epidemiological facts about suicide prevention. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, UNC's new Suicide Prevention Institute. And we're also uh, going to discuss uh, programs supporting students' mental health at, uh, here at UNC. Um, and after uh, that will open up the floor for a discussion. Um, for our Q&A, uh, for people who are attending uh, the webinar, please uh, enter your comments um, in the Q&A box and we will sort of curate those and bring them forward um, when the opportunity arises during the, during the Q&A sessions. Um, and for the next portion of the program, we're going to uh, have a uh, more philosophical and ethically focused uh, discussion uh, about suicide with our guests who are uh, philosophers and uh, also philosopher psychiatrists. Uh, and we're really looking forward to uh, getting things started. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Gal. Well, thanks, Dan, uh, for, uh, for getting us started today. Uh, next slide. and can advance them. So we're going to be taking on the issue of suicide and suicide prevention today, uh, as Dan had laid out. We have here some of the CDC uh, unified definitions of uh, suicidal self-directed violence. And I want us to note that according to that CDC definition, that suicide self-directed violence constitutes behavior that is self-directed and deliberately results in injury or the potential for injury to oneself. And I think this is important, there is evidence of suicidal intent. I think there's a lot there to unpack. And I think as our day goes on, some of the issues around suicide, its definition uh, and its prevention will be brought to light. Next slide, Dan. As you can see from these uh, uh, global suicide rates, uh, the issue of death by suicide is a worldwide issue. Uh, also, I think very interestingly, uh, it is not a uniform issue. As you can see here, the various colors depict the rates per 100,000 deaths by suicide. And there's quite a range depending on where in the world you are. So it's global, but at the same time, it's not a unified uh, problem in the sense that it's the same everywhere. Next slide. Here we have uh, uh, some leading causes of death for young people ages 15 to 19. And of course, we'll be turning to issue of campus mental health in just a, a little while. I think what's really striking here um, on a global basis is where suicide fits in for these young people as a cause of death and the total numbers of people dying by suicide uh, worldwide in this very young age group. Next slide. And in, uh, in the global picture, we see that in some areas of the world, the suicide rates are declining, whereas in the Americas, the suicide rate is increasing. And so uh, in uh, the Americas, uh, this is a worsening problem. And uh, we all know that the global pandemic has greatly uh, increase the prevalence of mental illness, particularly anxiety and depression disorders, contributing to attempted and uh, death by suicide. Next slide, Dan. And this is just a graph showing that increase in the suicide rate. Some drop off, but uh, there's concern that it is going to be increasing again uh, here in the United States uh, as a result of that increased prevalence mental illness. So both globally and in the United States, this is a very significant problem. It affects young people uh, and older folks. Next slide. 
This is a busy slide and I'm not going to spend our time going over all of it. I'm going to highlight a couple of things. If you look at the top left area, you see about 46,000 Americans dying by suicide. That's about twice or more than twice the homicide rate in the United States. Very rarely does suicide get the attention it deserves as opposed to homicide. And also, if you notice there, about one third of people who died by suicide were 55 years or older. So there are gender disparities around both attempt and death by suicide, as well as age uh, differential. I've now reached the age where I'm at high risk uh, for death by suicide. And uh, th this is a problem, therefore, that one might say is, is could be seen as uh, uh, going across the lifespan. And then if you look at that upper right area, you see that about 90% of folks who die by suicide have a mental health condition at the time of, their, of that suicide occurring. Uh, other facts on here, we may come up as we have our discussion today, the role of firearms in, in death by suicide, and of course, the impact on our veteran population, very, very significant influence there. Next slide. So uh, we uh, will be talking about suicide prevention efforts today, uh, both from a uh, scientific policy and uh, philosophical perspective. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it back to Dan to take us right on into our first speaker. Yeah, thank you very much for laying out some of those kind of uh, background epidemiological uh, facts for us to sort of have in mind uh, moving forward with this discussion. And um, next up on the program, uh, we have uh, Dr. Patrick Sullivan, um, who uh, could, could not make it uh, to be here in person today, but uh, has provided us with the recorded presentation uh, discussing uh, the new UNC Suicide Prevention Institute. Uh, Dr. Sullivan is the Jurgen Distinguished Professor of Genetics and Psychiatry here at UNC, and he's, he is also a professor at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. So uh, uh, let's we'll now uh, roll uh, Dr. Sullivan's presentation. First of all, let me begin by thanking uh, Dan and Gary for the invitation to speak with you today. Sorry, I can't be there. There was a scheduling issue that didn't work out. But I'm super pleased to speak with you about the new UNC Suicide Prevention Institute, which I'll call SPI from now on. And the whole story begins with the tragedy. This is Bill and Dana Starling. Uh, Bill is a UNC alumnus, and um, Bill and Dana lost their two adult sons to suicide. Um, and you know you can imagine how horrible that must have been for them and what a continuing set of difficulties it, 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 it presents. But beginning with that um, comes a number of relatively massive questions. Um, Bill and Dana made a large philanthropic gift to, to UNC Chapel Hill that allowed us to begin SPI. And the goal that Bill has set for us is to do to make steps to prevent suicide. And this raises massive questions. What exactly is suicide prevention, really? The, and what is achievable here now at this point in time in North Carolina? Prevention requires a time and a place. So where, when, how, and who? Um, and how do you do things that are rational, impactful, impactful, and scalable? That's the ambitious mission we're taking on in our attempt to help Bill and Dana turn a tragedy into something that has at least some benefit. The initial vision from our proposal was a, a five-page PDF. Um, this was sort of the killer figure we had. We envisioned three components, causation, neurobiology, uh, implementation of clinical prevention, and also an outreach, community engagement, and dissemination component. This, of course, is the difference between Shakespeare on the page versus Shakespeare on the stage. You, the, the black and white text is one thing, the realization, all the details that go into making a stage performance um, is obviously a rather different matter. And that's the, that's what we find ourselves with now. So the question that when we started all this back in July of last year was how do we begin? Um, I intentionally, it started with Grace and myself 
and that was it. Um, I intentionally decided to uh, put ourselves into stealth mode until really the next uh, three months after, from April to June is when we're coming out of stealth. Um, mainly because there were so many things we needed to do. Um, I'm Midwest guy. Uh, in my background, you don't talk about what you're going to do in you know big uh, capital letters and with press releases and all that. You do it first and then describe it second. Um, this is obviously a really huge topic: suicide prevention. There's you know thousands and thousands of papers going back a century or more. And I certainly know the ideology of NED literature. That's a big part of my professional identity for 20, 30 years. Um, but it's been a long time since I've been I've done anything in the invent, in, in the intervention science space. So um, I read a lot, um, read a lot of reviews, had our people present reviews, and I've had a lot of conversations. I've probably spoken to at least 150 people um, in the last nine months, um, and that's ongoing. And what it comes down to is some empirical questions. The, the first is, we use data to drive what we do. And that becomes the question of who. And um, we want to do things that are scalable. We're in the middle of a crisis. I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, and it's, it's really important that we actually come up with things that are not you know, a super fiddly 20 session intervention that requires you know, a, a person with 20 years postgraduate experience that would not that's great, and, and we should have that and do that. But that isn't something that will scale to meet the current crisis, and that's something else that's on our mind. Um, implementation needs a where and a when. If you're going to do something, it has to be very specific in terms of the timing of it, in terms of location, and it has to be a place that we can actually reach from where we are here in NC. And team science needs a team, and so then, then there's a question of how. What you know? What what's the intervention specifically, and how do we actually do it, deliver it, measure it, et cetera. And I should mention that one thing that came up in all these conversations was that even after doing this for four, five, six months, I was learning that there, was, there were people at UNC that were doing totally cool things. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's crazy that at UNC itself, we don't know what everybody else is doing, you know, around the corner, around the block, and in the same department in some occasions. So we're going to have a de-siloing meeting. The goal is to basically bring together researchers at UNC and for them to describe what they're doing so that people know who they are and so they can find partners. The strength in numbers, collegiality and collaboration is part of the DNA of UNC, and we need to actually do that in this space too. So on uh, August 30th, uh, probably in the afternoon, we'll have a de-siloing meeting. Save the date. Um, uh, Chancellor Gustowitz has kindly agreed to give the kickoff, and I'm really confident we'll have some fantastic presentations, and that will be a pretty challenging and invigorating day. So, please. So, we begin also with the data. What is North Carolina like in March of 2023? Um, this is a whole other talk, but it comes down to three things. Um, epidemiology. Um, the, the trends in suicide are horrible. Um, they're getting worse, and instead of better, reversing the trend over, uh, that's at least a short-term trend. Um, and in particular, it's hitting youth. Um, uh, in addition, that's also mirrored with, as you would expect, um, markedly worsening trends in depression and anxiety. It's a really bad time to be a teen or a child, child or adolescent in North Carolina right now, as it is in the States, as it is in many other countries in the world. Um, this is actually the worst ever um, mental health crisis in my career. Um, so going back since the late 80s, when I started doing all this, um, this is definitely the worst. How did we get here? There's a reasonable question to ask. Um, and if one reads the editorial pages of virtually every rag out there, e-zine or e-paper out there, this is clearly multifactorial. We argue about it. If we could reverse it right now, if we could take a step and change the factors that, that um, well, first of all, if, if we could come to a consensus these days, which is very difficult, and if we were to come up with a consensus idea of what are the factors that led to this and change them tomorrow, um, how long would it, that, first of all, that's exceptionally unlikely. Second of all, how long would it take for us to see the impact of that? It would change things, but it would take years and years and years for the change to actually be manifest. Therefore, uh, I think we have to accept it as it is and, and move ahead. 
Um, the big picture is the mental health situation in children's adolescents is absolutely awful and particularly hitting subsets, black youth, LGBTQ plus kids as well. Um, medically, we also know second that a medically serious suicide attempt is a potent marker for risk of death over the next five years. Uh, the risk is something on the order of 9% absolute and 30X relative. In other words, it's a huge flag. It's a very, very strong flag for the death of a relatively young person. In addition, um, on top of everything else, waiting lists for many departments of psychiatry, especially child psychiatry, are six months plus. Um, emergency departments have become, like medical emergency departments, have become a de facto psychiatric crisis. Um, there's some nice things happening at UNC that have been announced recently that have helped change that, but that's where it is as of um, the last couple of years. In addition, of course, there's also the healthcare burnout issue. A lot of people are quitting, a lot of people are, dis are distracted, and um, a lot of people are very unhappy with their working conditions. So it's it's a tough situation right now, um, and we're trying to do um, we're trying to add a number of things which we believe will be beneficial. And the next thing, of course, and this is no surprise to anyone from the philosophical bent, is to define prevention. Exactly what do we mean when we say prevention? You know, typically you, you see people from talking about upstream to downstream with the, the little cataract there being uh, uh, rapids or a fall um, to represent a suicide uh, attempt. And I personally like the suicide, I like the uh, etymological terminology of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. For primary prevention, you go as far extreme as you can. You do whatever you can to keep a case from happening in the first place. The case here would be a suicidal individual. Um, second um, is when a person actually is suicidal, we do the best we can to, to identify them and to actually do something effective to, to move them further upstream or even um, back onto dry land. Tertiary is following a medically serious suicide attempt, and how do we improve the outcome of those individuals? So those are the three the three ideas that we have, and the interventions that we've plotted out are basically um, organized in that way. So how do we establish the SPI? Um, I'm a team scientist at my core, um, and team science needs a team, and this is the, this is part of the team that we have. Um, uh, We've got a document that's got the biography of everybody here. And for a lot of the people here, um, this suicide and suicide prevention is very personal. Um, that something has happened to somebody they knew well, somewhere, somehow, um, and that had an impact on them. Um, it's a big tent intentionally. Um, we've got people from undergrads to full professors to you know, distinguished professors um, from a wide, wide range of departments um, and increasingly between people that aren't from UNC uh, Chapel Hill itself. Um, uh, as a, and this, I think, is the right way to go. This group has been meeting um, on a regular basis um, over Zoom for eight months now. Um, the conversations we have have been absolutely fascinating, and it's been incredibly important and helpful to me to hear what other people think about this um, in order to, um, you know, in order to actually help formulate what we're going to do and how it's going to work. Um, obviously, policy is not our thing, but it's ridiculous for us not to have connections. Um, we are connected to UNC higher-ups in multiple ways, which is great. Um, we talk regularly with um, people at the NC State DHHS. In fact, we hope to hire the NC State coordinator. This is a, uh, a position funded by the, uh, by the governor of North Carolina, who actually we hope will actually sit both in SPI as well as um, in the state office, so that we can actually make sure that our, our efforts are aligned as well as they can be in a, in a bi-directional way um, with what's going on in the state. We want to make sure that what we do is consistent with what they're doing. And if we come up with something interesting, we want to make sure they're, they're aware of it so they can think about whether that has a wider role as well. Um, one thing that has been put in the uh, bridge too far category is means reduction. Uh, means reduction is exceptionally well validated historically. Um, you can decrease the suicide rate by decreasing the availability of the specific means of self-harm. Plenty of examples of this where, where this has been done in, in nations and cities, and it actually works. And in fact, 53% of North Carolina deaths uh, by suicide involve a firearm. 
it's a logical thing to consider some version of how that might uh, of means reduction of, with firearms. However, as everyone in this call is no doubt aware, this is an exceptionally complex socio-political um, uh, conversation, um, and there are many, many downsides. Um, and this is something that is obviously on our radar, but it's not something we're immediately taking on. We're listening, we're reading, we're talking to people. Um, if it comes to the point where there is something that's sensible we can do, we'll do it. But right now, I've been advised to put this aside for a moment. So the core ideas that we have are this. First, um, there are major efforts out there right now for the detection of suicidality and mental health first aid. We strongly, strongly report these. These are super, super important, and it's wonderful to see all the things that are happening. The, the situation is much different now than it would have been two or three years ago, which is great. However, it's also our opinion that of itself, this is insufficient. Um, if you find somebody who's actively suicidal, we need to do things that are effective, not just have them sit in an emergency department for two weeks. Um, and that's, that's essentially the, the idea that we have. Um, in addition, SPI can fund large-scale implementation projects, um, but we certainly can't do something that's statewide. That requires a different level of, of input, energy, and coordination. We can suggest agendas. We can show things that we've proven to work. We can, we can make training and the paths for others to follow as, as good as possible, as easy as possible. We, of course, can also help people with quality assurance, quality improvement, so that it works better if they can monitor how things are going in their locale. In addition, we want to do uh, interventions in entities that we can reach. So inpatient, you know, we can do things at UNC Hospital, and we can do things at increasing numbers of inpatient and outpatient emergency department and primary care settings, um, and in high schools. Um, there are other things that we'd like to do in the future. Um, we, we're exploring doing interventions in churches. Some of my colleagues in Australia have, are actually doing interventions in malls, where you can walk up as a kid, walk straight in, get treatment right away, no appointment, no fuss, no muss. Um, that's for the future. Um, the clinical interventions, of course, have to be empirically supported. Um, we don't want to do, we don't want to suggest or do something which doesn't have strong empirical support. Um, it has to be ready to go. There has to be a manual, it has to be standardized, and it has to be scalable. Ideally, we would, would embed this in a progressive treatment algorithm and collaborative care. We really like doing this in the context of primary care because that can be a great way to sort of destigmatize it, obtaining medical, mental health and also having a consistent physician or primary care person um, who can actually take care, who can actually you know, be with the kid and the family over the long haul. Okay, so phase one, 2023 to 24, this year, next year. Um, starting with tertiary, um, firstly, um, we've gotten, with the help of Gary and uh, Samantha Meltzer Rowdy and a lot of other people, uh, Don Rosenstein, Sarah Lawn, we've managed, and Robin Clore, we've managed to get IV ketamine approved at UNC Medical, Surgical, Psychiatric, and Emergency Department use. Um, ketamine is an anesthetic that, if given, um, has been shown to markedly and relatively rapidly reduce depressive symptoms as well as suicidality. It's a great way to buy a bridge for somebody who's in hospital following a medically serious suicide. So we want that tool um, that, that'll be available to the consult liaison team at UNC uh, Health. Um, and so that's in the process of being implemented. Um, in addition, we're, we're aware that one place where a lot of people fall through the cracks is following a suicide attempt. Of course, they're seen by psychiatry. Of course, they're given an outpatient follow-up. However, a lot of people don't actually make that follow-up. And because they don't necessarily get engaged in care, there's no bridge from inpatient to outpatient, um, I think a lot of people fall through the cracks and remain at high risk. And what we're talking about is there's... Um, an RCT-based, standardized, scalable, um, manualized treatment called CLASS. And the idea is it begins following a medically serious suicide attempt, and it's meant to be a bridge to outpatient care. Um, it involves case management, uh, some, some family therapy or some work with a significant other, as well as something called acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, Jimmy Chen will lead the effort, and we're in the process of actually recruiting and training the staff to deliver it. We're hopefully able to roll that out um, in Q, 
three of this year. And we're planning a, a behavioral crisis move um, for youth. Um, there's three different approaches we've been able to identify. We're sort of going over the pros and cons of each. Um, Danielle Lowe is a child psychiatry fellow um, who will be becoming, uh, a, a, she's a child psychiatrist who will become faculty at UNC in July. And she'll be working with us to try to implement this. So that's the tertiary piece. Um, by the way, if this works, we would rapidly try to extend other parts of this to um, other places in North Carolina. We would also make our protocols available so that other people could adapt and use them in their own context if they wish. Um, secondary prevention. Um, so essentially here, what we want to do is we would like to deal, we would like to improve the treatment of youth uh, anxiety and depression. Prevalent conditions right now in high schools, some something approaching a near a majority actually have significant depressive, have had significant anxious or depressive symptoms over the last year. Um, Danielle Rubinov um, uh, is a recent recruit to UNC. She's been a fantastic partner uh, in this work. Um, she is an expert in the delivery of um, scalable brief treatments for these problems for this population. She has a group called CHAMP at UNC, and we've been working together closely on this. We've identified a, a brief treatment that's meant to be delivered out of pediatric primary care called FAST. FAST A is for anxiety, FAST D for depression. Um, she and her, her colleagues are undergoing treat, are treatment, undergoing training in these right now. Um, we hope to begin implementation shortly. Um, in the planning phase, um, I, I need to do something in adult primary care where passive suicidal intention, in other words, for instance, yes, I've been feeling as if I'd be, it'd be better off if um, I were not alive, um, but do not have a plan immediately for it. So passive suicidality is, is the term typically we use. And adult, so we want to do this in adult primary care. There are a lot of people with this right now. And we think for some ideas about how we can actually do things relatively briefly to improve the status for most, or many at least. And then finally, um, in terms of primary prevention going upstream, um, uh, I've been super fortunate to uh, uh, be able to work with Dorothy uh, Esplage and uh, Marissa Marcini. Um, these are a couple of fantastic colleagues over in education um, who are experts in this um, move called Sources of Strength. Sources is essentially uses the peer and click network of a high school um, in combination with trusted adults um, to essentially build resilience, to, to make high schools more tolerant, um, reduce bullying, identify kids that are in trouble, you know, essentially using the click network of a high school. It's been around for a couple of decades. It's been shown to work. Uh, it's got great potential to, to decrease mental, improve mental health, decrease suicidality. We are currently recruiting for 10 high schools um, in order to uh, implement this. Um, and then I'm a scientist also at my core, and I'm really aware we don't have enough data in order to help inform things. So um, we are going to get all the data for people who uh, made a medically serious suicide attempt and were seen at UNC Emergency Department from 2014 to the end of last year. Um, we need to understand what happens to somebody when they come to the emergency department. Where do they come from? What happens? When they're there, how long do they stay? Do they see psychiatry? What happens after the ED? Do they get discharged? Do they go to inpatient somewhere? Do they go to an operating room, et cetera? If they're inpatient, do they get to see psychiatry? Is the referral? What happens with the referral? All that stuff. Um, so essentially here, no one understands what happens right now at UNC Hospital following a medically serious suicide attempt. If we can describe that, I'm confident we'll find that there's gonna be places that we're doing great, and places where things can be improved. That's what we need to understand. In addition, we're, we're trying to capture a ton of data about North Carolina. Um, we've got some wonderful data scientists in our group. Um, we need to understand the demography. We, understand, we need to understand the school structures. Um, we need to understand you know, what, where, where are the places where suicidality is prevalent, um, or suicide is prevalent, I should say. Um, and this is obviously, for us to help with something, we have to understand it well. There are likely to be hotspots, places that need more than they're getting, and that's what this will help identify as well. And then um, I work half-time in Stockholm, Sweden, at the Karolinska Institute. 
Um, and there with my colleagues, Lui and Fang Fang, we're actually doing some epidemiological work on a, on a national scale to describe what happens to people following a medically serious suicide attempt. The data about the risks of the mortality risk following that is surprisingly not awesome. And we want to improve this by doing a national scale study um, where they have relatively complete electronic health records. And then finally, I won't go into the, the last part here, that's probably for another time, but there's a number of interdigitating projects where we want to work really, really hard on um, using some of the major tools we have right now in genomics and transcriptomics um, to look at the genomics of suicidal behavior. Can we understand the biology? Can we understand where in the brain changes occur? Um, we've got a bunch of stuff going on there with some um, world-class individuals. Um, what else is coming? Things that are being developed, but they're not mature enough for us to talk about. Um, first, our goal is to serve the population of North Carolina, not just one segment. Um, therefore, we need culturally congruous interventions. Um, major groups here would be Black youth, um, as well as treatment delivery in Spanish. Um, I guess the other one, in addition, would be the Native American population, would also is something else we're looking into. Um, we want to also think about delivering treatments uh, in non-standard places. Generally, in clinical medicine, people come to us. These days, we can go to them. Um, the, 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 the development of telehealth has been a complete game changer, necessity during the pandemic, um, and something that is exceptionally important now in, in terms of a tool of reaching people in a rural county or something. Um, and so we're, we're working on that. Um, and then we really want to work hard to establish progressive or collaborative care within primary care. In my view, psychiatry really should be a specialist rather than a primary care um, uh, uh, discipline. Um, and that means that we need people to, we need to deliver um, mental health care in primary care, but to do it in such a way that's scalable. So it might be that um, there's a specified single session intervention that the primary health, the primary care provider can deliver. If that works great, it, it, for some it will, many it won't. Then they go to a brief treatment, like fast in primary care, for instance. And if that doesn't work, then they something else happens, perhaps a medication trial. Um, but then at that point, people get referred for, to psychiatry. I think that scalability there will be something that um, is, is crucial. And a lot of this involves having mental health care actually in primary care in one way, shape, or form. And that's something that Nate Soa and, and Samantha Mills Brody and Gary are strong advocates of, and we want to make sure that that is part of our thinking and gets cemented in as well as we can. Okay, so that's it for my talk. Uh, and thank you for the, um, the opportunity to describe our work. Um, we really want to move fast, flexibly, and we're always open to new ideas. One advantage of the Starling gift is that we can move quickly. If we think something is a good idea, and if we can find a path to do it, we'll make it happen. We don't need 79 levels of improvement and all that, but we can just get it done if, we, if, if it makes sense to get it done. Um, so a couple of examples of this, I was talking to some undergrads in my lab, and they came, they came up with some ideas, and then we're, they're making a poster um, to, to advertise the 988 phone number. This is the National Suicide Hotline number um, in toilets at UNC. This is something the UNC Health Beacon program has done super successfully. And I think this is a great way to get eyes on a poster. Um, Dr. Sonia Richardson at UNC Charlotte has got some amazingly interesting approaches, novel approaches about how to deliver suicide prevention efforts to black youth. Um, and that's something that uh, we're, we're talking to her a lot about too. If people want to talk, who are listening now, who want to talk, who want to get involved, let me know. And my thanks to the SBI team, especially the people who are leading the inventions, and Grace Litter, who's been just fantastic at, at helping me keep all the balls in the air and to make sure no details get dropped. And then finally, I guess the most sobering thing is the question that Bill Starling has put to me, which is, what can you do so that no parents have to go through what we have? And that's been the thing that's been driving us really hard over the last nine months. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sullivan for uh, remotely providing us with that presentation about the work of SPI. Now that we've kind of looked at some of the um, 
kind of suicide facts globally, nationally, <clears throat> looking at the issues facing North Carolina. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Jane, Amy Johnson, who's Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, and Adjunct Associate Professor at the School of Education, uh, to talk with us today about uh, UNC's approach uh, to, to some of these issues. Thanks so much, Dan. I'm glad to be with you today. This is a topic that's extraordinarily important to us at UNC, and I, I'm pleased to be here with so many partners. Uh, I'm also really happy to follow Patrick's presentation, <clears throat> somebody who's a new colleague of mine. And I think you'll observe a lot of connective tissue between what I'm gonna talk about today in terms of our experience as an institution of higher education and what Patrick, the foundation that Patrick has laid as we move from really a conversation, I think about uh, the research and what we know from science and practice, particularly with sort of an inst institute kind of focus now to our approach to policy and practice uh, at, at higher education institution using UNC, of course, as a case study. And in the same way that Patrick started with a story, I felt it was only appropriate today to start with a little bit of a story of our own, um, particularly as it relates to me and my role and how I came to Carolina as I'm a relative newcomer <clears throat> to the university, and also to lay some context and foundation um, to the case study that I'm about to share. So I joined the Carolina community in August of 2020, right at the height of the pandemic. And although I haven't been at Carolina long, I've been a practitioner and a faculty member for most of my 25 years in higher education <clears throat> and college student mental health has been a big focus of mine throughout that time. <clears throat> in fact, student mental health with a, was a key facet actually of my interview uh, process in February and March of 2020, and was a primary topic of the town hall that I delivered as a part of my final interview. Back in the days when we were hoping that COVID-19 would pass within a matter of weeks to months. And I was particularly fortunate to be hired and as the months wore on, and we were needing to maintain um, isolation practices and social distancing for much longer than I think we had ever thought or hoped, I began talking with our team and student affairs and colleagues across the campus about an idea for developing a communication and norming campaign that would reinforce our sense of connection and a strong sense of community that we have at Carolina to combat the compounding effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on an already extremely serious mental health pandemic, as I think Patrick has nicely laid out. And a primary impetus, impetus for all of this was based on my own experience in coming to UNC. So I, I need to be honest and share a personal anecdote here that when I first submitted my application to Carolina, I was a, a little bit hesitant. Carolina appealed to me because I have a commitment to access to education and the mission of public universities. I am the daughter of a mom who was a public school teacher and administrator for her whole career. So it's embedded in my family's DNA. And then the diversity of the community, the chance to get to work with such an academically talented student body was extremely compelling. But I was living in Washington State at the time, and COVID was spreading like wildfire. And the idea of packing up my family with a 13-year-old son who would be starting middle school, which, by the way, if anyone's playing the home game, is exactly when you want to uproot your child, all of that and moving to a completely unfamiliar place. We had never lived uh, in the Southeast. I knew no one here during the middle of a pandemic. All of that seemed really daunting. But then I came for a one hour interview on campus and I met the search committee and I was hooked. People were extraordinarily gracious and kind and seemed to genuinely enjoy each other's company, which came across during an interview, which in my experience rarely happens. And we had a terrific uh, conversation. And I returned home to Washington and told my partner that it was too soon to tell if Carolina was truly interested and would want me. But if I got offered the job, we were going to need to figure out a way to move ourselves across country. It was clear to me from that very first conversation that based on the way my now colleagues talked about Carolina, that this place for the people who work and go to school here and live here has real meaning. Sense of community is palpable and infectious. 
And I could share about eight more instances when I had a chance to see the sense of community at work before I ever landed in North Carolina, including the day I accepted my offer and within an hour had my email inbox fill up with messages from folks at the university who I'd never met, reaching out with words of welcome and offers to help me find housing, and doctors and middle schools and their favorite places for barbecue. So now flash forward to me talking with our team in early 2021 about how to counteract the really damaging effects of the pandemic's social distancing and isolation. And I kept reinforcing that one of the best assets that we have is that sense of community and connection that I felt very early on. How do we bottle that up? Uh, that sense of caring and compassion and community and give it a name and an identity and make it work for us. So while that idea is being formed and we're all figuring out how to design websites that pull together all of our campus resources in an easily accessible way and create an identity that will resonate, and we jump ahead to fall of 2021 when we had a horrible spate of student deaths, including suicides and some tragic accidents and some health crises that absolutely rocked our community. This was not the first time that I'd had an experience with this, but it was definitely the first time at Carolina and probably to a greater degree. And I echo Patrick's concern and observation that in my 25 year career in higher education, I've never seen anything like this. We absolutely knew that mental health among college age students, and I use that language intentionally, college age students was <clears throat> already a significant concern. And of course, the pandemic just kicked that into hyperdrive. So as Chancellor Kevin Guskowitz and I and several others, including now one of my all-time favorite colleagues, Samantha Meltzer Brody from Psychiatry, we're talking about what additional resources we could put in place quickly to support our students and our entire community. I told the Chancellor this idea that we had about this, what we had called then the Tar Heels Care Network or Caring Network. And just shared with him that it was really in sort of, you know, a very early kind of stages of um, idea generation. <clears throat> and he turned to me at the following the conclusion actually of our fall um, commencement ceremonies. And he looked at me and said, make it happen. And so that's what we did in a matter of months. And in February, 2022, with the help of too many great partners around campus to name, the terrific guidance and oversight of our comms and our IT experts, we launched the Heals Care Network to give both a physical presence and a name to a theme that came from our mental health summit in November, 2021, following these terrible, tragic student deaths and to really give an identity to Carolina's culture of compassion and care. So that's what starts my presentation today. And let me see if I can move on, there we go. Um, so I started with the Heals Care Network, and that is really, I think, an appropriate beginning. Um, this became uh, a hub for us with a wide array of campus resources. And I will click on this now, but um, I hope you'll have access perhaps to our slides later or check out our website at care.unc.edu. There's a wealth of resources there, including a resource hub that is probably one of the cornerstone sort of foundations of that application, which actually helps individuals identify themselves by community, by interests, by the kinds of um, resources that they think they need. And the, the, the resource hub actually provides for you then a tailored set of options that you may want to pursue, whether you're interested in clinical care or non-clinical care, whether you're a faculty, student, or staff member, whether you want a virtual option or an in-person option. So that's really, as I said, the cornerstone of that particular application. But it also has, as I hope you'll see, information regarding suicide prevention. Uh, it has information. One of our great uh, additional features, particularly for students, is the ability to immediately chat with a peer um, through a partnership that we have with our um, with one of our communities on campus, what we call our listeners support network um, in partnership with our Carolina Peer Support Corps um, and colleagues, Ed Fisher uh, and, and other resources across campus, uh, an array of opportunities for folks to get in and get connected and get engaged both with the community and some specific help as they need it. But most importantly, one of the things that came out of what I'll talk about in a minute, which was a launching event that we had at the start of that, or actually, I guess, about mid-semester in fall 2021, was our mental health summit. 
was this idea of the culture of compassion and care. That was a message and a theme that came up over and over again. And we said, we're capitalizing on that. That is something that we're gonna talk about at every turn. It is one of the best assets that we have, as I mentioned, one of the best protective factors institution-wide, if you will, um, in terms of us addressing suicide uh, on campus. But it also does another important thing, which is we observed and heard repeatedly um, across our community that folks were interested to help, they were interested to participate, but they didn't know how. Um, and they didn't know, they didn't know um, what they could do. And so the Heals Care Network is also an idea that is designed to reinforce that every member of the Carolina community has a role to play. Um, whether or not that's active clinical care or referral or support of a friend uh, or a colleague or a family member, that, that we all have a responsibility to address the mental health needs um, of our community and that there is a way for everyone to plug in. We've received great um, feedback. One of the things that we have also promised as a result of this website, and uh, I'm pleased to see that that has borne out, is that we will continue to add new content. We'll keep updated events there. Additional resources are being built across the campus every day. Um, the Suicide Prevention Institute, just one example of those. Um, and so we'll continue to keep this fresh and this will be a living resource um, for folks in so many ways. The other thing that I wanted to talk about was an important piece that also has come up as a part of our conversations, which is the need to keep the conversation going. Uh, if there was any positive about, I think, the pandemic and what I really call the sort of multiple conjoining pandemics here. We have a viral COVID pandemic, we have a mental health pandemic, we have um, a race, uh, racial issues pandemic. But the idea that we are now talking about mental health in a way that I have not observed in my career, particularly over the last five-ish years, uh, and especially as a result of the pandemic, we are not othering mental health in the same way that we did once before, and how that can translate into help-seeking behavior, how that can translate into stigma reduction, particularly among college-age students, particularly among diverse communities. Patrick has alluded to some of the specific needs of those communities and the cultural norms and so forth at play. Extraordinarily important. So how can we make sure that we don't treat this as a one and done conversation, that we continue to keep the dialogue um, and this topic at the forefront of our minds and our actions? So we held the Mental Health Summit as a really a kickoff event to a larger campaign, as I alluded. And we uh, invited and did panels that related to faculty, staff, and students. And we also focused in on three key themes that you see there in the sub bullets, which are prevention, crisis services, and campus culture. And in particular, as may um, stand to reason, a lot of uh, what we discussed in the campus culture piece has helped inform what we do in the Heals Care Network and our broader campus resources and programming. And then we said, all right, the Mental Health Summit was important um, and it was critical, but it was one day. It was not enough to address all of the sort of critical topics and needs and interests of our community. And in particular, we want to keep coming back to this conversation. So we agreed immediately as a result of the dialogue that we had in that summit today to create a program that we call our Mental Health Seminars. We launched those in spring of 2022, immediately following the summit and have continued that program every semester since. And typically we have approximately one um, mental health seminar a month while uh, during the core of the academic year, take a hiatus in the summer. Um, and we solicit the community for topic, suggest topic suggestions. And we've been um, overwhelmed with the kinds of things um, that folks are interested in. Our goals in these seminars are twofold, which is one, to educate, and two, to continue to discuss and uh, and uh, create resources for our community and opportunities for our community to, again, plug in tools that they can take home. It's notable that uh, to us, whereas the sort of first semester, I think, that we did the mental health seminars, folks were interested in intersections and the opportunity to better understand connections between mental health and our identity and daily lives. So we tackled topics like um, mental health, faith, and spirituality, uh, mental health drugs and alcohol use, mental health and gender-based violence, 
And in more recent topics, folks have been interested in um, focusing more on skill building and how to increase resiliency. So we've had topics like it's okay to pause and understanding emotions and how to talk about them, how to foster happiness and how to center your focus when focusing is difficult. And those have received uh, throughout a high response. We have typically somewhere in the order of 75 to 150 um, folks attend those seminars still to this day um, and give us new topic ideas every time we post the videos on our Heels Care Network website and the views also remain high. Folks go back and tell us about how they they attended the mental health sem seminar at the time and they've gone back to it to re-hear and listen to some of the messages and some of the ideas. So that has been a particularly popular program uh, in our community. And we also agreed that um, what we needed to do was probably to have a kickoff event um, starting uh, in the fall of this last year, this current uh, academic year that we're in. So we launched the new academic year with a briefer, not a full day summit like we did in 2021, but a colloquium in which we spent a half day taking a deeper dive into a topic. So we discussed mental health and identity um, at our September 2022 colloquium. We also reviewed the progress that we've made with the community and then talked about, okay, what are the next steps? What are the next things that we feel like we need to do? Uh, and what are the future topics that we can add to our seminars and other sessions? I anticipate that this will be something that we'll be doing for some time, uh, at least as long as I continue uh, at Caroline, I can expect that we'll hold a mental health kickoff event and a discussion each year. Again, to reinforce, because we have new folks join our community each year, that this is something that's critical to us. It's a conversation that we're gonna have all year and we want everyone to be playing a part. In addition to the programming, we've been extraordinarily fortunate to have some wonderful mental health partnerships. None the least of which, as you've probably heard me allude to a couple of times today, is the relationship between CAPS, which is our counseling and psychological services team that we oversee in student affairs. We did not have heretofore uh, a relationship between CAPS and our Department of Psychiatry, but as a result of these collaborations, we now have uh, an MOU in which our um, Department of Psych a Psychiatry team provides direct patient care to students three days a week. They also manage our uh, meds management program for us. It has been an extraordinary partnership and one that I expect will continue and that our students have really valued. We also uh, have been very fortunate to get an anonymous $1 million gift to Student Affairs in January 2022. Patrick alluded to the fact that telehealth has been a game changer in this area, and it absolutely has been for us as well. Again, one of the interesting things that we have observed as a result of the pandemic in particular is that <clears throat> whereas telehealth, particularly as it related to counseling services, our students were not big takers on these resources prior to the pandemic. But one of the things that has come out of this is that students observed, you know, I talked to my counselors um, via video appointments during the pandemic, and I was actually pleasantly surprised. Not only did that relationship work, but there was something really wonderful about being, you know, in the comfort of my own home, sitting on my comfy couch or on my bed, talking to my counselor that I really liked. And for our students with accessibility concerns or ge geography concerns or families um, and schedules that they had to manage, the idea that this would be accessible to them and also accessible in a much broader 24-7, round-the-clock, um, late-nights uh, kind of resource that many of our students value has absolutely been a boon for us. So again, as a result of this gift, we have been able to fund a telehealth contract for our mental health counseling for five years. We did experience a period of time in October of 2021 for, where for the first time in 14 years, we had a wait list. That wait list existed for about uh, a week and a half and was a, still a relatively short period um, as wait lists go. Um, students were experiencing about a one to two week wait for um, basic therapy. Um, but as a result of implementing this telehealth contract on an emergency procurement basis, um, we signed with a contractor named You Will, which is um, well known uh, by student affairs and the higher education universe. Um, we were within um, uh, just a very short period, I think about two days, able to completely eliminate that, that wait list. 
Demand for telehealth remains hot. Students' um, satisfaction uh, evaluation of the telehealth opportunities also remains high. It, it just makes the pie bigger in terms of our students' access to care. We've signed on with a new vendor for 2023 uh, following a full bidding process. Academic Live is also the contractor for our partner NC State uh, here in North Carolina uh, and an emerging leader in this field. So I, I don't anticipate that we're going to go back uh, from telehealth. I think that particular resource is here with us to stay, and I'm, I'm glad for it for all the reasons that we noted. I won't spend a tremendous amount of time here because we've already had an opportunity to take a deeper dive into the Suicide Prevention Institute, but that in addition to the UNC Health Child and um, Adolescent Psychiatry Initiative uh, is going to be an extraordinary asset to us, we feel. Um, it is critically important that in order for us to be able to address college students' health needs, which particularly at a place like Carolina with both undergraduate and graduate students that span, you know, ages from 16 to 80, knowing and being able to build off of what happens at the child and adolescent level and what we can learn from research there and how we can help facilitate those connections is extraordinarily important. The last piece is where I want to spend, this last bullet is where I want to spend a little bit um, more time today because I'm not sure it's a relationship and a resource that many folks are familiar with. Um, and it is actually a relationship that I had um, been a part of helping to found at previous institutions and now here at Carolina, which is the JED campus relationship. Folks may be familiar with the JED Foundation also created by a couple who lost their son to suicide when he was a student at the University of Arizona. This um, foundation was created in 1998, has um, since become a real leader in the field, particularly as it relates to um, uh, suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention at the high school to college level. And what the JED Foundation does is sign on with a JED campus relationship. Typically, in any given year, they're running about 400 of these partnerships, again, across um, both uh, high schools and colleges and universities. And we signed on as a JED campus um, within the last year. So wanted to spend a little bit more time, as noted, talking about the um, JED Campus program and our partnership with them. As you can see here, we launched that relationship in February of 2022. It is a four-year um, commitment and relationship that you establish, and I'll talk a little bit more about the sequencing of that. Not only does it address mental health, but it also addresses the important connections of mental health and suicide to substance abuse and misuse. Uh, and so that is something that you'll see reflected as we talk about this relationship. They provide an array of assessment tools. Every uh, GED campus is assigned a, um, a uh, counselor, in effect, um, with GED who serves as our advisor and partner as we go through the process. They recommend practices and help us um, support an implementation plan that we develop over that four-year term. And we also have access to an additional research tool through the Healthy Minds Survey, which is a survey, again, that um, Jed helps us uh, promote and launch um, and gives us not only some great information and data and findings that are, are pertinent to Carolina, but provides due to JED's, uh, the JED campus partnership and its relationship with other institutions, some longitudinal and also great benchmarking research that is available to us. And I'll spend some time talking about what we have already preliminarily learned from our mental health, excuse me, from our Healthy Mind survey um, based on the data that we have just received. This may be a bit small for many folks to um, see depending on your particular screen, but Really what this is designed to do is to share with you what the sort of timeline of that four-year JED campus partnership that I addressed earlier looks like. So the first year you spend, as you can see from the box, is they're doing some assessment planning. There is an extensive institution-wide survey that we fill out. We have created, as most schools do, a JED campus advisory team and group that helps facilitate the institution-wide response to that assessment tool. Based on the information that we provide, then JED gives us back a, a draft strategic plan with some recommendations um, based on a playbook that they have um, that has uh, that again crosses both um, higher ed institutions as well as high schools. 
And then in years two and three, which is where we are now, as you may observe from the timeline, we move to implementation phase. So we have um, coordinated with our JED advisor uh, and developed uh, not only among our uh, advisory group locally, but some uh, subcommittees that spread beyond our advisory team. Um, we're working right now on honing in on those areas where we have the most room for growth and developing some specific action plans that we will implement in years two and three. And then in year four, as you'll see there, you move to evaluation status. How far have we come? What does the road look like ahead? And as we move to JED campus alumni status, um, how can we sustain this and keep the program going? and continue to evaluate our success and provide a feedback loop so that we keep the sort of momentum that we have established due to this really intensive four-year experience living well beyond that relationship. In terms of where we are with our partnership, I just wanted to briefly touch on um, we have we're very pleased with the results um, that we received as a result of our uh, uh, assessment program and the recommendations for a strategic plan, you'll see there we have a wide array of um, facets of the um, assessment module that we completed our institution wide survey that we already have completed or in process. The university, one of the great assets um, of a large research university like ours is we have so we typically have so many resources. Our challenge is often um, I think again, sort of um, harking back to Patrick's presentation is making sure that we're not siloed, making sure that these things are networked uh, and that students have a safety net um, as well as our colleagues, frankly, have a safety net in terms of um, the various facets that you see there. So all to the good, we think in terms of the resources that we um, have well underway uh, or uh, already in process in terms of improvement. But there were a number of areas, and again, I think there there is um, a, a link back to Patrick's presentation here, where we had more significant room for growth, and you'll see some of those there. I, I will say, uh, Jed provides a playbook that is designed to cross the universe again of higher education as well as um, high school, and so not all of the recommendations in their playbook play as nicely, if you will. Um, with large research universities as they might for a smaller liberal arts institution of, you know, two to 3,000 students with a modest number of faculty and staff. Um, there are things that make, uh, that are necessarily more complex at our institution. And some of those things I think you um, see here, a tuition insurance policy is something that we're working on. Um, while we have great relationships with local services, we have historically not had formal MOUs for an array of reasons. Some of our services partners are uncomfortable with that approach, um, but it's, a, it's an idea that we're still exploring. But the last one there, frankly, is what I said at the outset uh, that I thought that we would see um, in terms of our data, and indeed it came back. Means reduction and mean safety is, I think, an area where it's certainly not that we, you know, uh, have done nothing, but completing an annual campus environmental scan um, and making sure that we are uh, setting in front of students every obstacle um, for a student who may be experiencing some suicidal ideation um, or actually developing um, a plan. Uh, everything that we can put in front of students um, to encourage uh, or to discourage, excuse me, um, uh, they're taking action on such a plan or such an idea and encourage help seeking behavior and make sure that we help them uh, is critically important to us. So that's a big, going to be a big area of focus, I expect, throughout our relationship with Jed. Then lastly, I mentioned that I would share a little bit about our Healthy Minds survey. We just got the data back, I think, um, a little over a month ago. It is extraordinarily complex and a great deal of it, even though um, while our response rates are modest, this is typically what we are seeing right now across surveys, um, it, particularly institution-wide population or um, sample-based surveys, frankly, a, a, a response rate of about 10%. So we appear to be right sort of consistent with our broader experience in terms of assessment and institutional research there. But we are going through that data and I only have some preliminary information um, for you today. 
but wanted to share with you some of the key topics there that um, you could see that Healthy Minds touches on um, and the kinds of data that we'll be able to get back and hopefully use to inform both practice and policy. And um, I have just a couple of um, elements here that are uh, data points that we have already been able to capture. And as noted earlier, I think you'll see both some protective factors and some real risk factors here for us institutionally for our students. Um, again, these aren't new. And I think in particular, the first three aren't surprising to us at all. We definitely know that finances, food insecurity and housing insecurity uh, um, have been for some time and are increasingly major contributors to students' anxiety, depression, and mental health um, needs. One of the things that I um, do take as a protective factor here, um, I like this number better for the undergraduate students and I like it for graduate students, but again, at a large research university like ours, I don't think that number is probably atypical, um, but the idea that we are connecting students to our campus, that they are engaged in the life um, of campus, uh, have relationships with their peers, with faculty and staff. This is a critical factor for us. Uh, and so we want to do everything we can to continue to bring down that number of no co-curricular engagement, very little outside um, the, the, um, their academic life involvement in campus. We want to continue to bring those numbers down, both for our undergraduate and graduate professional students. We, we like this number here. I would still like this to be higher and think there's opportunity for some growth at, uh, at Carolina, particularly due to some of the uh, culture and community that I mentioned before. But the students observe that students' mental and emotional well-being is a priority at school. And I, although I don't have uh, the ability to sort of go back in time and assess what this number looked like before, things like Heals Care Network and some of the intensive work we have done to engage in dialogue about this issue, I have to believe that that has been a port, an important factor. It is certainly something that we hear anecdotally, that students recognize that we're talking about this on a regular basis and that it is important to us and to them. The fact that students see themselves as a part of the campus community, again, something that I think is a real asset. I expect that, uh, although I don't, have not seen benchmarking data, but I expect that um, this number is higher at Carolina than, I than we would see at other institutions. Again, connecting back to that culture of compassion and care that we've talked about and this identity that be what it means to be a Tar Heel, and what it means to be a part of Carolina community, how that manifests itself in terms of the life of a student. I think those are really important. These numbers, while concerning, don't surprise any of us. Uh, and they do, as you may observe, uh, reflect a range. So, you know, students indicating that they need help for everything from feeling some sadness um, and some basic, um, uh, uh, sort of blue feeling, um, which is often something that students describe as sort of short-term uh, worry, uh, but can relate all the way up to full-blown anxiety, clinical depression. Um, we are seeing a range, we are seeing more students come to our doors with actually a clinical diagnosis of a mental health condition, um, an ongoing one, have a pattern of seeking care. All of that is positive. It does create challenges for us, particularly when folks look to um, Carolina and our counseling center on campus as their primary resource for some of those, especially when students have more specialized needs. But then also something that we uh, that I think is is a, a real plus for us, something in our pro column is that students feel that they're treated fairly and equitably on campus and that know that the community cares about them and has their back also a really good protective factor. So I think um, an expected uh, but uh, reflective uh, uh, perspective of what we know of college students and college students at Carolina, particularly as we take uh, I think, again, a case study uh, of Carolina and our policy and practice at the university, what we have done over the course of the last um, couple of years uh, in particular. And I hope that there is something for other institutions of higher education and other organizations perhaps to take home and learn from and continue to explore as we address this critical issue of um, suicide, particularly on our campuses. 
just a couple of key takeaways that I would reinforce. Um, again, one of the things that we have found has real meaning and has been uh, an asset to us is its culture of compassion and care. I think that is something, one of the, um, the observations that I take from this is that uh, all that this takes is I think creating uh, an opportunity to express this in multiple ways, to talk about it. This is something that any organization I think can use as a take home and to reinforce um, that even though so many folks, I think particularly at the outset of the pandemic, described feeling helpless and that they didn't know what they could do and that they didn't know how they could help, we have again heard anecdotally from our community that folks really have taken this on and understand it and appreciate it. And it's empowering for our community that we can all do something about this. And in fact, we all need to do something about this. Supporting mental health is something that requires a network multi-tentacled approach. It is not exclusive to clinical counseling. We have many folks in our community who don't need clinical counseling, and in fact, who even if they need it, won't pursue it. So it is important that you have an array of resources and take a full court press, I think, to addressing this issue. And then making sure that folks know across our communities that resources are available and accessible. And particularly at a large place like a Carolina, how can folks take what sometimes can be an overwhelming number of resources? I know that there's this and this and this, but I don't know what the best one is for me. I don't know exactly how to plug into it. You know, how do I go about that? And how do I pick the right one or the right ones um, for me? Making sure that that is tailored and accessible um, is a particularly important piece and something that we have heard and will continue to press into in our assessment and research whether or not this is working um, and is an effective tool. So with that, let me pause. Uh, Dan, I don't know. I believe that um, you're going to help curate some questions for me if I have that right. I'm glad to take any questions that um, folks may have. Thank you very much, Amy, for your talk. Uh, really appreciate you sharing the UNC approach uh, to, to suicide prevention and um, showing that, you know, taking a very um, multifactorial, uh, multi-methods kind of approach seems to be, uh, you know, a, a way to really uh, address some of those upstream uh, concerns and downstream as well, right? Okay. It's not just going to be the clinical staff approaching this, um, but I think we got a glimpse of sort of each dimension of intervention and, and what uh, we're doing here. So thank you for sharing that. Um, appreciate that a lot. Um, so yeah, uh, our first comment is going to be from Gary. And uh, let me just say, I'll also be uh, evalu monitoring the Q&A for our attendees, and I'll be bringing those questions forward. But I wanted to just make a comment, Amy, that uh, first of all, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And what strikes me both by your talk and Pat's talk, and I think something that will come up when we move into our uh, uh, philosophy aspects of all of this, is just how much of this involves the non-clinical environment, uh, resiliency building, uh, a feeling of community, a feeling that there are people you can reach out to for help. Uh, I'll say from the psychiatrist side of the house so often, uh, you know, suicide prevention interventions are often seen as coercive uh, and, uh, you know, are, and often are, uh, frankly. But what really strikes me about the approach that you've taken and Caroline has taken and that the Suicide Prevention Institute is really looking at those primary and secondary prevention and how those can actually lead to a lessening both of the pain and suffering that people have uh, as well as uh, hopefully presenting, preventing tragic outcomes. And I will say just one other comment on, on the meme side. I had the opportunity to visit uh, Cornell uh, University last summer and noticed that all the bridges had bridges. nets under them. Uh, for yeah. those who've been to Cornell, you know there's many gorges and uh, 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 sort of crisscrossing the campus, as a matter of fact, and many bridges uh, and as a means of uh, reduction uh, uh, program, it seems that Cornell had put these nets under the bridges to try to prevent people from just jumping to their death 
uh, maybe in a impulsive way. And I'll stop there and thank you. And I'll be now monitoring and I'll bring other questions forward. Thank you for that, Gary. I think that's right on the money. So Amy, two questions I'll bring forward that are kind of the same thing is uh, what evaluation methods are you planning to use to monitor the progress of these initiatives? And secondarily, or in another question, what barriers do you still see to people accessing these resources? So evaluation methods and barriers to access that continue to exist. Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. So the evaluation methods that we use, as you imagine, one of the things that we try to do is to have them sort of in a very targeted manner. But we also try to do this sort of broad-based evaluation that things like Healthy Minds get us. The challenge with those kinds of tools, though the population-based tools in particular, is they don't help us isolate the variables and understand the things that really are probably more difference makers than others. Um, but so, you know, we continue to pursue, and, and again, one of the things that we are, uh, I, I think, have as a benefit is a, a healthy institutional research team. We also have our own assessment and research team in student affairs that we use. We have colleagues in the provost's office. So we're able to do both a, a very sort of program by program event almost based assessment. Um, you know, is this something, uh, what did you learn today? Uh, you know, are you able to um, immediately, do you see yourself as immediately being able to implement these tools? The sort of longitudinal perspective is harder. And then of course it gets uh, also more challenging here again to isolate the variable and understand uh, exactly how that manifested perhaps years later. But we're doing both things at the very localized programmatic level and at the broad based institutional level. We have um, tools that I expect that we'll continue to keep through um, our, our CIRU uh, research, which is a study of um, education at the, educational institutions that are research universities. We will continue to keep up our, um, our NCHA, ACHA data, which is the American College um, Health Association's um, National College Health Assessment data that we do on a regular basis. Um, so we'll have a number of tools that we use to also probe for what are the resources that appear to be working best for you and how did it manifest in terms of, you know, reducing, um, uh, the incidence of ideation, alcohol use and abuse the kinds of things that we talked about. So that'll be a primary focus. In terms of still the barriers, I think overwhelmingly still the barrier that we hear from students is I, you know, I, I was uncomfortable pursuing counseling. I didn't feel maybe like I needed counseling. And especially in certain communities, barriers that, you know, among my tribe, pursuing mental health care is not considered appropriate. Uh, you know, my parents don't want me to do that. They don't want me to take my problems outside of our family or outside of the house. There are a lot of cultural norms and individual norms at play that address the um, a challenge to help seeking behavior in the first place. So I think overwhelmingly that's the thing that we have to continue to work on is the stigma issue and the um, and the resistance uh, that we experience. But I, I've seen that we've made huge steps, particularly over the course of the last two years in that, and anticipate that that will continue to change. And then the other challenge, frankly, that we experience is students are often, as I alluded to, presenting with really a more specialized need. Um, and we are an institution of higher education. And one of the challenges for us is that our primary mission is education. We have counseling resources, we have resources to help with housing insecurity and food insecurity and financial challenges and all those pieces. But at the end of the day, those aren't our areas of specialization. And so how can we also make sure, as I alluded to at the end, that we have active and really helpful and streamlined referral resources to specialized services, specialized medical care for a student who's actively experiencing some psychosis or you know, needs long-term mental health resources. How can we make sure that we are doing that handoff and helping facilitate that in a really um, easy and accessible way for our community? I think those are probably the two biggest that I would make. There is, there's another question, Dan, but I don't know if you want to conclude us now so we have a break before our next program. 
we've got a, just two or three minutes to. Uh, All right, I'll, I'll just bring it quickly then, Amy. So a question arises is whether the Jed Foundation can help contextualize how well that 10% response rate uh, represents the campus more broadly. You know, it seems like a small response rate, even if that's what these things typically, is JED able to provide a context so that you can understand maybe more broadly the campus? Sure, and it's one of the things that that um, always concerns us when we have, you know, a response rate at 10%, whether or not it's generalizable to the larger population. And based on the responses, uh, and I did include, I think, a little bit of information regarding, you know, who responded, the undergraduate and graduate, gender um, spread, um, identity, race, um, ethnicity. We always look for those things. And so we do have that information from Jed, but we'll be pressing into it and also be doing some calculations to try to uh, develop correlations between, you know, are there special things that we're hearing from our Latinx community or African American community or women on campus or graduate professional students that we're not hearing from undergraduates that will allow us to develop some perhaps more specialized resources. So our, our preliminary scan of this is even at the 10%, it's relatively generalizable and we'll be able to get some good lessons from this. But remember, Healthy Minds also isn't the only tool that we'll use. You know, we have our ACHA data, we have Ciro, we have Nessie, we have some other things that we'll also use to make sure that we're keeping a finger on the pulse broadly of our campus community and not developing tools and resources based on a, you know, potentially a, a, a small sort of snippet um, of our population. Appreciate that question. Hopefully I did that in two minutes or less. <laughs> Great, and, and thank you again so much for your time and for uh, presenting the UNC's uh, perspective and approach to uh, suicide prevention. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, and so now we're gonna take our first break of the day and uh, we will resume at 10.30 sharp. Thank you, Amy. Thank you all, pleasure to be with you. Thanks for everyone's work on this incredibly important issue. See you all at 10.30.
Welcome back. Um, so now we're going to turn to the uh, next phase of our uh, discussion. Um, we're so pleased to have our uh, distinguished uh, guests with us today. We have three people from outside of UNC providing uh, talks. Um, the first one is uh, by Professor Michael Cholby, who is a uh, professor and personal chair in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. And we're so pleased to have you here uh, with us today, Michael, to discuss um, ethical dimensions of suicide prevention. So um, take it away. Uh, well, great. Thanks, Dan. And thanks uh, to all the members of the audience for being with me today. Let me go ahead and share the slides that I have developed for today. Okay, there we go. Um, and sorry to those who are expecting a uh, charming philosopher with a Scottish accent, uh, despite teaching here in Scotland, I am a bona fide American. Um, in any case, what I want to do today is share with you um, a framework for the uh, uh, for suicide prevention, ethical framework for suicide prevention that I've been thinking about in recent months. And I want to just begin with a question that I take it is important, but it's important that we not overlook it in thinking about the ethics of suicide prevention. And that's the question of what are our reasons for intervening in suicide? Why is it that we think we have good reasons to try to prevent suicide? So I take it there is what we might call a kind of prima facie case for pre preventing or intervening in suicide. One reason that we might think so is that we might think that certain acts of suicide are morally objectionable and even wrong. There have been philosophers historically who have argued that uh, suicide is a wrong to God or a wrong to one's community. Others have argued that sometimes suicide wrongs uh, our family members or particular individuals. So that might be one reason that we would have for preventing or intervening in suicide. But I take it that in most cases, the reason that seems foremost in people's minds is not so much that um, suicide amounts to a moral wrong, but rather that suicide is often imprudent, that the suicidal person is considering doing something that is a harm to themselves in some sense or another. That is to say that they are uh, choosing in their lives uh, before they ought to, uh, when it comes to the standpoint of their own well-being. So I'm going to take it as a kind of given for the purpose of this talk that there is this prima facie case, that we uh, think that there is a basis, a legitimate basis for preventing or intervening in suicide in general, um, and turn our focus instead uh, to the question of means and measures, right? On the presumption that there is a prima facie case for preventing or intervening in suicide, how should we do it? And what kinds of uh, ethical uh, constraints or principles should govern how we intervene in order to prevent suicide. Now, this is, I hope, a timely intervention. Uh, certainly the uh, uh, presentations by, by Patrick and Amy earlier uh, in our conversation today, I indicate that it's certainly timely in the UNC campus community. I think it's timely in many campus communities, but it's also, I think, timely at a national level. Uh, where I am here in the UK, uh, there is a national conversation occurring about uh, the nation's suicide strategy, and you see similar kinds of conversations going on uh, throughout the world. One movement that I think is particularly striking in this connection is the zero suicide movement. There are um, organizations of this kind in a number of countries, the UK, Sweden, a few others, who espouse, as one of the groups says, the foundational belief that suicide deaths for individuals under care within health and behavioral health systems are preventable. Now, uh, on the one hand, this seems to me to be a laudable uh, suggestion that we should uh, want to prevent suicide deaths when they occur. But on the other hand, as an ethicist, I have to say that my back stiffens and some red flags go up when I hear words like zero. Uh, is it really the case that we should want to do uh, each and everything that might minimize uh, the frequency of suicidal deaths to zero? And should we uh, be worried equally about suicidal deaths that um, don't really fall within the providence of healthcare systems. I think we might wonder whether there might be uh, some suicides that while preventable, uh, perhaps we should not prevent given uh, the uh, unethical nature of the measures needed to prevent them. So my purpose today is to, I think, intervene in a conversation that has really always been taking place, I suppose, but has become a, a bit more lively in recent years as a number of communities and a number of societies are rethinking uh, their national suicide strategies. Now, 
Uh, my own take in terms of the, the literature in uh, philosophy and bioethics, uh, my own take on the literature on suicide prevention is that it is kind of fragmentary and piecemeal, right? If you look about in this literature, you can certainly find discussions of the ethical justifiability of particular kinds of measures and means. Uh, there's certainly been in the past a lively conversation about uh, the use of involuntary uh, hospitalization or commitment for suicidal persons, uh, discussions about uh, compulsory medication and so forth. Um, and there's a fairly rich discussion of the subject in the philosophical literature on paternalism. But what I don't think there is, by and large, is a, a systematic way of thinking about the ethical questions that uh, suicide prevention and intervention uh, provide us. So what I want to do today is to provide, um, well, perhaps not the uh, ethical framework for thinking about it, that would be a bit hubristic on my part, but at least an attempt at um, offering something like a framework that I think can be an important first word in this conversation, even if it doesn't turn out to be the last word. And I call it a framework intentionally. I'm not putting forth today something that um, I think represents a kind of recipe or an algorithm or a formula for uh, how we might think about particular uh, intervention or prevention policies or particular acts of suicide prevention. My aim is rather to identify what seem to me to be the salient ethical factors for thinking about uh, the ethics of suicide prevention. Uh, if you like uh, metaphors, perhaps uh, it's useful to think about what I'm providing today as something akin to an ethical dashboard, a kind of set of measures for thinking about um, the ethical defensibility of different kinds of suicide prevention uh, strategies or measures. So let me go ahead now uh, and articulate uh, the main pillars or the main elements of the framework that I'm offering today. So it rests on these six factors, and I'll proceed to describe the factors in greater detail. So the first factor is the rights of suicidal persons. The second is what I'm calling anti-paternalism. The third, biographical welfare. The fourth, population tailoring. The fifth, the prioritization of high cost cases. And then finally, resource efficiency. Okay. So I wanna say a little bit to motivate and explain uh, each of these six factors. And what I want to do after I've done that is then uh, subject these to a bit of ethical testing. That is to say, uh, to try to uh, indicate what the framework um, implies about different suicide prevention measures and policies in the hope that um, it will yield um, results that strike us as fairly intuitive in cases where we think that there are certain measures that are uh, ethically unjustified, that the framework implies that those are unjustified, in cases where we uh, already have the intuition that uh, a certain prevention measure is uh, justifiable, that the framework implies that those measures are justifiable. And then especially interesting to me, I think, is what the framework might say in cases uh, that uh, are perhaps controversial or where our opinions or intuitions are unsettled. So let me begin then with the first factor, which is the rights of suicidal persons. So the first uh, factor says to us that a suicide prevention policy or practice is more morally justified to the extent that it honors suicidal persons' uh, rights. Uh, to first, privacy, and I have in mind here privacy with respect to medical care, employment, and domestic life. Secondly, bodily integrity. And third, freedom of movement and association. So I think that uh, suicide intervention always will implicate individuals' rights. We are, after all, uh, seeking to try to prevent someone from ending their lives in a certain sort of way. And this naturally raises questions about whether, in so doing, we are going to be infringing upon their rights. And I think that the three rights that I've enumerated here are particularly crucial when one thinks um, about the history of suicide prevention policies and measures throughout the world. There have certainly been, I would say, um, measures uh, that have been undertaken in different societies that don't honor these rights, that are, stand in violation of the suicidal individual's privacy, uh, that violate the rights to bodily integrity, that right, violate the rights of freedom of movement and association. And I would add to this a kind of uh, proportionality rider, that to the extent that we are willing to violate a person's rights, it seems to me that our willingness to do, show, do so, pardon me, uh, should be proportional to the seriousness of suicidal ideation. That is to say, the greater evidence we have or the stronger our evidence that we have that someone is contemplating, planning, uh, implementing a um, suicidal act, uh, the greater willingness we should show to uh, uh, infringe upon these rights, uh, the lesser uh, likelihood or lesser the evidence suggests that they are intending to engage in suicidal conduct, uh, 
be less willing we should be to uh, infringe upon these particular rights. So that's uh, the first element of the framework. Let me now turn to the second. The second element I'm going to call anti-paternalism. And this is the idea that a suicide prevention policy or practice uh, should give default, but uh, what I call prima facie priority to a person's current preferences, values, and commitments. Okay. Now, when we think about paternalism, what we're typically thinking about is intervening in someone's choices or actions so in what we take to be their benefit, but without their consent. And in so doing, what we're in effect saying is that a person's current preferences, values, and commitments, in this case, the preferences, values, and commitments that are leading them to contemplate engaging in suicide, are in some way wrongheaded, irrational, don't in fact reflect uh, their considered interests, right? So we are in effect, uh, when we are engaging in paternalism, discounting, right, the person's uh, current or stated preferences, values, or commitments. And in general, I think we need strong reasons for uh, treating people not in accordance with their current preferences, values, or commitments, what their um, statements, utterances, behavior tell us right now. Uh, we need strong reasons to disregard that or to discount that in favor either of what we would expect their preferences to be in the future, right, what they would uh, want uh, um, further down the road, alternatively in, uh, by reference to what we might think of as their considered preferences, the preferences that they would have if perhaps they were uh, um, uh, thinking differently or if they uh, had a different frame of mind. Okay? So the thought here is that I think we should presume when it comes to suicide intervention a uh, present rationality on the part of the suicidal individual. And all the more I think that when we think about uh, suicide prevention measures we should in general opt for the less paternalistic one over the more paternalistic one when we can. So if we have uh, two measures before us, each of which we think is roughly likely, uh, equally likely to be effective in preventing someone from engaging in suicidal conduct, then I think we should opt for the one that is more in accordance with their current preferences. All the more, if it can enjoy their consent, then that seems to give it further ethical warrant. Okay. So uh, we now have two of the factors uh, um, articulated, uh, the rights of suicidal persons and anti-paternalism. Let me now turn to the third. The third is biographical welfare. And this is one that I think is easy to overlook, but I think is actually quite vital. Uh, this one says that a suicide prevention policy or practice is more morally justified to the extent that its effective use results in suicidal individuals having better lives on the whole when weighted against the short-term risks. Okay. Let me give you um, a little bit of a backstory to this particular factor because I think it illustrates the uh, potency of this factor very nicely. So I had a number of conversations, or have had a number of conversations, with the philosopher Doug Husack, who in the past has written on uh, policies related to uh, drug addiction and drug abuse. And one of the arguments that Husack often makes that I find very convincing is it doesn't make much sense for us to say that we are um, engaging with a drug addict in ways that are supposed to be beneficial to the drug addict if our ways of engaging with that drug addict end up with his life or her life being far worse than it would have been had she been using drugs. And Husek argues that you know long-term incarceration is a pretty terrible thing, right? And so incarcerating drug users, in his estimation, is not uh, justifiable typically by the lights of biographical welfare. We are in the um, name of someone's well-being doing something that in many cases probably makes their life worse as a whole. So what this says uh, in connection with suicide prevention is that we should, uh, when it comes to suicide prevention, use those measures that will result in a person having a better life on the whole uh, when the uh, measure in question was effective or would be effective in preventing their suicide. And I think that the relevant baseline for comparison here is to ask ourselves this. What would the person's life have been like, right, uh, had we used this measure and uh, had it prevented them um, from engaging in suicide and they uh, proceeded to live more or less their natural lifespan versus their having ended their life at that given time? And the question at hand is, uh, if we do intervene in this way, are we um, causing them, right, to have a life that was worse on the whole? I hope that people see what seems to be the incoherence, right, of defending a suicide prevention measure on the grounds that it's a, a benefit to its target, if in fact it makes the person's life worse. Okay? So the thought here is that we shouldn't have any measure uh, whose purpose is merely to prolong life that doesn't provide reasonable assurance that there's going to be an improvement in total quality of life. So just to give one example where it seems to me this would be particularly salient, uh, 
Uh, we might think, for example, about persons whose uh, suicidal ideation could be uh, managed through psychotropic drugs. Right? Uh, if a person's uh, suicide could only be prevented by the administration of psychotropic drugs over their lifetimes, that seems to me to raise an important question. What is the impact of their taking these psychotropic drugs on their overall well-being for a year, a decade, several decades, etc.? seems to me that we don't do them a service by preventing them uh, from engaging in suicide if what we're doing to them ends up with a life that's worse as a whole. So that's the third factor, biographical welfare. The fourth factor is population tailoring. Here's the thought behind population tailoring. So this says that we should desire for our suicide policy or uh, suicide prevention policies or practices to be inversely proportional to the degree to which a person is likely to engage in suicidal conduct. So the thought here is something like this. When it comes to um, individuals who have a low likelihood of suicide, su suicidal conduct, we want our policies or practices to involve a low likelihood of harm or risk uh, to them. Conversely, we should tolerate a higher likelihood of harm or risk to those who are more likely to engage in suicidal conduct. Now, it seems to me that one of the challenges that those in the mental health profession face is while it is true that uh, many of those who engage in suicidal conduct do have uh, mental disorders of different kinds, the converse doesn't hold true, that the overwhelming majority of those who have mental disorders, uh, even those that are closely associated with suicidal conduct, don't actually engage in suicide. And this is, of course, one of the difficulties from uh, both the clinical and I think public health standpoint, that there's a very high risk of, if you will, overshooting the mark, right? That is to say, of our uh, prevention policies or practices um, involving, right, or subjecting to risk or potential harm more people than ideally we would want to be subjected to it. There's also the possibility of undershooting, though I think that that's perhaps rarer. But in any case, what we would want, ideally, is for all and only those who are uh, most likely to engage in suicidal conduct to be subject to whatever prevention measure or intervention measure it is that we're considering. Let me turn now to the fifth factor. The fifth factor is what I call prioritization of high cost cases. So prioritization of high cost cases rests on the thought that um, death is not equally bad or equally unfortunate for all persons. Right? So uh, it seems to me to be the case that, for instance, one thing that one might say about um, laws that permit assisted dying for those who are terminally ill is that uh, to the extent that it's possible that people might use these laws mistakenly or imprudently, they don't probably lose all that much. If you are likely to die within two or three months, uh, then your dying now rather than in two or three months, even if it is a harm to you, is a fairly modest harm to you. In contrast, of course, there are people whose uh, death via suicide it seems particularly unfortunate for them or particularly tragic, if you will, because it's particularly harmful. So it seems to me that when we think about suicide uh, prevention policies or measures, we should be thinking, for example, probably more about adolescents rather than the aged. After all, adolescents seem to have more to lose due to premature death than the aged typically do. In saying this, I'm not suggesting that we should be unconcerned about the deaths of elderly persons due to suicide, but that if we have our druthers, we should choose to prioritize um, suicide prevention measures that are effective with respect to adolescents rather than, say, the elderly. Likewise, um, we should think uh, uh, in terms of the number of health maladies that suicidal persons present beyond uh, their suicidality. Those who are otherwise healthy, of course, are likely to live um, perhaps long and robust lives uh, in the absence of suicidal conduct, whereas those who have many other uh, health comorbidities may not. Perhaps uh, intervening in their suicides should take a lower priority, relatively speaking. So that's population tailored. Uh, sorry, uh, prioritization of high-cost cases, pardon me. And then finally, resource efficiency. So resource efficiency is the fairly obvious idea that we want our uh, prevention measures to achieve our objectives in minimally costly ways. And in particular, uh, we should take into account the opportunity costs of utilizing resources to prevent suicide that could be utilized to address other community uh, mental health related needs. I've recently been involved in a research group um, of individuals uh, thinking about suicide prevention in countries such as Germany, the Netherlands, uh, in, uh, countries in Scandinavia, and one of the things that they're uh, contemplating um, quite ardently is the question of whether suicide prevention is or ought to be the very top priority of the mental health community. Could it be the case that uh, our overall mental health, uh, population level mental health, is better served by using resources that 
might be directed toward suicide prevention, toward other kinds of mental health concerns. This isn't to say that uh, suicide prevention would not count at all, but it does seem like a reasonable question to ask whether suicide prevention should always be the very top priority, right, of mental health communities and communities as a whole. But in general, of course, we don't want to use our money in inefficient ways. And there are, of course, some ways of um, preventing suicide that are very costly. Institutionalization and so forth uh, is certainly not inexpensive. Now, when I think we, uh, the way to understand this framework is that I'm, what I'm offering here are, as I said, a, a set of factors, not a kind of recipe or formula, but that each of these can be thought of as other things being equal conditions. Right? Other things being equal, we should uh, conclude that honoring a person's rights makes a prevention measure more justifiable, violating them less justifiable. Other things being equal, uh, prevention measures are more justifiable if they address the most harmful suicides, less justifiable if they indiscriminately target all suicides, and so on. So my hope is that the uh, factors that I've identified are, well, exhaustive, if I've gotten it correct at least, of the kinds of ethical factors that should shape our thinking about suicide prevention and intervention. Now, as I said, I wanted to spend uh, the latter half of the conversation today um, indicating what this um, framework might imply by way of kind of testing it, right? Does it seem to give us plausible answers uh, and in particular give us guidance in cases where we might think that we are dealing with uh, something where our, our opinions are in flux or perhaps we think of this as ethically controversial? So first of all, I think it, uh, the framework implies that a lot of measures that we would think are benign, ethically speaking, suicide prevention measures, turn out to be benign. So uh, public education campaigns, public awareness campaigns, seem to me in general not to violate people's rights, not to violate strictures on paternalism, et cetera. Uh, improved suicide recognition training for healthcare professionals seems to me to likely pass this framework pretty clearly. In many cases, restricting access to lethal means and technologies uh, seems to me to pass um, these, uh, uh, this framework pretty well. Uh, it was um, mentioned, I think, by Gary earlier, you know, the use of bridge barriers, uh, but there, of course, been other famous examples of uh, nations um, um, reducing their suicide rate by barring people ha to have access, right, to uh, suicide prevention, uh, sorry, suicide uh, technologies that um, are or were very readily available to them. So here in the UK, uh, it was possible for you to uh, end your life uh, simply at, by uh, turning on uh, your stove, if you happen to have a coal gas stove uh, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, it released a sulfurous gas that would suffocate you. Um, and uh, this was phased out. These were phased out in the 1940s and 50s with clear positive impacts on the suicide rates here. Likewise, I think anonymous suicide hotlines are likely to fare well here, likely not to violate people's rights, not to be paternalistic, etc. So I think that the measures that most of us would think of as pretty uncontroversial, things that almost every society uh, does, or at least contemplates doing, probably pass ethical muster here. On the other hand, there are some measures that I think a lot of us think are seriously troubling that require very, very strong justifications, ethically speaking. Uh, and these are um, measures that I would say uh, my six-factor framework gives us reasons to oppose. So surgical interventions, uh, particularly when uh, surgical interventions are non-voluntary and detrimental to long-term well-being, I think are ruled out right, by my framework. Uh, fortunately, uh, the practice of lobotomization doesn't occur much anymore, uh, but it did occur in the mid middle of the 20th century, not uncommonly, in order to prevent suicidal thinking. But it seems to me that a powerful reason to reject this, uh, or several powerful reasons to reject this, are suggested by my framework, that it violates people's rights, probably leads to less overall quality of life, etc. Institutionalization and limitations on movement, uh, it seems to me, require pretty strong justification. Uh, this isn't to say that my framework implies that they would never be justified, but that we need pretty strong reasons to do so. I'm particularly impressed in this connection uh, with some of the research uh, suggesting that hospitalization for mental health and hospitalization for suicidal ideation is sometimes itself iatrogenic, that is to say, positively contributes uh, to suicidal behavior. That would be, of course, a particularly unfortunate um, outcome if that research is correct. And then finally, forced medication. That pretty obviously involves um, violations of bodily integrity. So I think these measures, which seem to me to be um, uh, among the most ethically controversial that we uh, have used to try to prevent suicide, um, are, uh, if not ruled out by my framework, they're certainly cast in negative light by this framework. Well, let me turn to a few cases where uh, there is some uh, controversy or where perhaps uh, people don't have settled opinions 
and just, uh, well, perhaps speculate on what the framework might say about these. I know Brent's going to be talking about this a little bit later on, but I don't mean to preempt him. Um, but, you know, there are, of course, uh, AI algorithms that social media platforms use to identify suicidal ideation and to notify users uh, that they've been so identified. Uh, I get notified by Facebook about every month, by the way, uh, that they're concerned about my mental health because, of course, I'm talking about the ethics of suicide on Facebook with other people. Um, little do they know that I'm not their target audience. Um, but this seems to me to be the sort of thing that we uh, uh, should think that the framework I've outlined today probably rejects, right? It tends to be fairly indiscriminate. Uh, it doesn't seem to prioritize high cost cases. It's fairly expensive. I understand that for Facebook, uh, they employ uh, uh, about 25 people, right, to uh, monitor, right, uh, posts for, for mental health content. And arguably, you might think it violates people's rights to privacy. So I would suggest that in all likelihood, uh, my framework is pretty skeptical of this and probably would reject it. Here's one that I suspect a lot of you have not heard of, but I came upon recently and I think it's quite interesting. Um, some have suggested that we might contemplate the addition of lithium to drinking water supplies. Uh, lithium is a well-known psychiatric mood stabilizer. Uh, I had someone tell me that uh, we should think of lithium as psychiatric fluoride. Uh, that it seems to be um, among the things that uh, provides a lot of protection against suicidal thinking and planning. Um, and a very interesting argue, uh, article by uh, Ning and Al uh, that came out in Public Health Ethics several years back made, I think, a surprisingly compelling case for the addition of lithium to drinking water supplies. Um, it's interesting to note that places in the world where there, is, uh, there are high levels of naturally occurring lithium do actually have slightly lower uh, rates of suicidal ideation. Now, initially, when I thought about this issue, I have to say I myself was uh, skeptical, but then when I began looking at my framework, uh, I began to think, well, there are some ways in which my framework is skeptical. This is not closely tailored, of course, right? If you put lithium in everyone's drinking water, uh, you're affecting far more than those who would otherwise have uh, suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideation. But uh, it seems to be very resource efficient. It doesn't cost very much. Uh, it doesn't seem to pose much risk to those who receive it. Uh, it doesn't seem to undermine biographical welfare. So I guess my own framework, somewhat to my surprise, might well support this. Uh, but I would be interested to hear what people think about that particular measure. And then finally, um, one that I think is particularly difficult to evaluate um, are what are known as active interventions uh, by suicide hotlines. So suicide hotlines operate differently throughout the world. Uh, in some parts of the world, uh, if you call a suicide hotline, you have the assurance that um, police will not be contacted uh, if you indicate that you are in the midst of a suicidal attempt. Uh, in other parts of the world, uh, it's possible that police will be contacted. Uh, this one, I think, causes me a lot of consternation, I have to say, uh, and I'm not sure quite what my framework says. On the one hand, uh, it has some, some positives in the light of my framework. It's narrowly tailored. Those who are calling hotlines uh, with suicidal thinking are presumably uh, somewhat serious about it. But it seems at the same time to involve uh, the prospect of, of violations of privacy, bodily integrity, and so forth. And there is, of course, um, there are, of course, unfortunate instances where police are dispatched uh, to um, locations where these calls are made, and the police actually seem to contribute to people engaging in self-harm. So I think that this is a, a controversial one, and I'm not quite sure what my framework says. But, you know, sometimes I think even the best frameworks leave us a bit in the lurch with some of the most controversial issues. So let me just end here then with some general observations about uh, what I think the six-factor framework implies. I think in general, one thing that the framework suggests to us is that suicide prevention is more ethically defensible insofar as it aims to prevent the formation of suicidal thought and plans, and less defensible as it intervenes in suicidal choice and action. Um, it seems I'm quite aware that I'm talking to an audience uh, where many of you are, are psychiatrists or associated with the psychiatric profession. But in general, I think from an ethical perspective, what we should prefer is to create a society where people don't have good reasons to be entertaining suicide as often as they do. And that, of course, we're going to have uh, psychiatry and mental health uh, professionals um, prepared as, if you will, sort of last ditch uh, um, uh, interveners. Uh, but on the whole, it seems to me that in some ways psychiatry uh, puts us in ethically perilous territory. Psychiatry is, of course, where people are going to be prescribed medication, where they might be uh, recommended for sectioning or for institutionalization or commitment. So in general, I think my framework gives us good reasons to pay more attention, be more concerned about the social determinants and environmental determinants of suicidality. Uh, 
uh, by Gary and, and Amy were mentioning this earlier. Um, but I think in general, society should think of themselves more as obliged to try to minimize the reasons that people have for suicide, but less obliged to prevent suicide for those who take themselves to already have these reasons. And I think we have a fairly good idea of the kinds of um, social and environmental determinants that are uh, uh, most prevalent, right, uh, or, or most strongly associated with suicidal thinking. These are going to include things like unemployment, but also drug and alcohol addiction. And unfortunately, uh, as Patrick's talk uh, uh, underscored in the United States, uh, access to firearms. So um, these, I, these, I think, are some um, underlying upshots of the framework that I've offered today. But as I said, uh, this was an attempt to kind of bring a bit of systematicity and order to a literature that I think up to this point has been very kind of fragmentary, people talking about particular measures or talking about particular kinds of clinical questions. Um, and my hope is not to, of course, have settled all the ethical questions, but maybe to have provided something that will uh, make the questions at least a little bit more tractable. So I'll end with that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, for your talk. And um, I'm going to now sort of monitor our internal chat and Q&A to see who has questions. Uh, looks like Gary's up first. Michael, thanks for a great talk. And I'll be monitoring the general Q&A and bring uh, forward uh, questions as they appear. Sure. I was struck, uh, if I get the factors wrong, forgive me, that in factor two, uh, what, what struck me is how ambivalence plays a big role in people who are thinking of ending their lives. There's an old saying in psychiatry that we only see the inept and the ambivalent, mm -hmm. people who have truly decided to end their lives and are efficient at it. We never see them. And so I wonder when we think about that factor and as the ethics of justifying in that case, how... <clears throat> we should recognize or incorporate the idea that someone might be quite torn about this. They might be mm -hmm. thinking about it, but at the same time don't want to do it. And I'll just add that I think that in a number of cases, I'm thinking of cases here where someone becomes emotionally incontinent as the result of, um, you know, let's say uh, uh, getting bad news about something. Uh, partner infidelity is a very common one. Those folks, if you sequester them for a short period of time, two to three days, it's almost universal that their desire to end their life ends. So I think a lot of times we're looking at the situation and wondering about the ambivalence, and, and I'll stop there. Thanks, Gary. It's a great question, and uh, it's somewhat ironic that you asked it because the project I was mentioning is actually a project all about suicidal ambivalence, and I've just punched into the chat there uh, the website of that project. Um, so I think that your question uh, cannot be given anything other than, than a kind of nuanced answer. Uh, I think one of the things we should not presume is that the presence of ambivalence is itself a reason to intervene or prevent suicide. Uh, why should we not? Well, uh, for one thing, it seems to me that uh, if we presume, as, as I suggested we should presume, uh, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, that people's uh, rational faculties are intact, that they're uh, you know, thinking about uh, their situation with some measure of lucidity and so forth, um, it's still a decision about which it seems to me that any rational person might well be ambivalent. Right? We are, after all, you know, making or a person is making a decision about uh, the duration of their lifespan and whether or not uh, they would be better off with a shorter rather than a longer life. And I think there's an important philosophical question here about uh, the relationship between ambivalence and, if you will, the stakes of the choice. Right? Uh, we often permit people, right, in, in other domains of human affairs to make risky choices even when they're ambivalent. Right? We permit people to marry, right? even if they're a bit ambivalent about their partner, or uh, have children, even if they're a bit ambivalent about having children and so forth. Now, you might sort of say, well, you know, this is, is a question, you know, the question of whether to continue in one's life, uh, you know, around which the stakes are, are great, and, and I agree with that. Um, but the mere fact of ambivalence, I don't think, shows or is, is a positive reason to prevent, given that it would make sense, right, for a person to be ambivalent. And there may be some ambivalence even when a person has concluded, right, uh, with some level of rational confidence um, that they are better off, right, with a shorter rather than a longer life. 
Um, so, I, so I think there's a tendency in some quarters to sort of suppose that ambivalence speaks in favor of prevention. Um, I'm not sure that it per se does. I think the most that it could say is that if we see, present, uh, we see someone who is ambivalent, uh, we might think of ourselves as um, intervening not to stop them, but perhaps intervening in order to slow them down, right? To make sure that they have the chance to determine, right, whether uh, uh, this is a decision that is in their mind, uh, by their own lights, you know, in their best interests. But it's, it's a very fine question, and that's what those researchers uh, are, in fact, trying to figure out. <laughs> so. Thank you, Michael. There's a question from the, uh, the attendees that revolves around the issue of how does motivation to end one's life uh, how would you incorporate that into your factor model? So examples might include a desire to avoid or escape a situation, a desire to actually die, a desire to help another person. And I was thinking of soldiers sacrificing their lives as a, an example of that. A desire to hurt another person, the idea that a suicide is often involved with an aggressive act, an atonement for something done wrong. How should we think about motivation? And it, as the questioner points out, as a somewhat separate issue from the ambivalence question. Right. So um, I think that this is best addressed by um, referencing the second factor, right? Anti-paternalism. I think if we genuinely are um, sort of principally uh, um, opposed, right? Opposed in principle to acting paternalistically, we don't uh, bring or shouldn't bring to our engagements with, with suicidal persons a kind of list of reasons that we think it's acceptable for them to engage in suicide for and a list of reasons that we think it's not acceptable for them to engage in suicide for. Um, it seems to me that this is precisely what we are um, subscribing to, right? When we say that we are opposed to treating them paternalistically. Uh, we're not saying, right, that there is a, a right reason or a, or a best kind of reason for engaging in suicide. Or, or a roster of incorrect or wrong-headed reasons to engage in suicide. That said, of course, um, uh, one of the things that I that I did not mention in the talk that um, uh, is, I suppose, the the most ethically benign uh, form of, of suicide prevention is persuasion. Right? And of course, one of the things we might ask somebody uh, who is contemplating suicide is, you know, what are your reasons, and are the reasons that you're contemplating good reasons even by your lights? Right? Does it really try to make uh, Does it really make much sense to you know, uh, want uh, to, to end one's life, right, out of a sense of our desire for, for vengeance, right, or uh, because you feel guilt, right, for some um, outcome that you probably had little to do with and so forth. Um, so I don't think that we should um, uh, tailor, right, or, or anchor, right, our suicide prevention efforts in people's reasons. But that said, none of what I've said um, bars us from trying to rationally engage with them and ask whether uh, what they're contemplating uh, is something that they're their best rational selves would endorse. <clears throat> Dan, are you, uh, you, you texted me, Brent, you have a question or comment? Thanks for a really clear talk, Michael. Thanks. This is great. Um, I think it actually sets things up pretty nicely for what I'm gonna say. So uh, I, I was a little bit surprised that you don't address the question of incapacity when talking about this framework. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm a practicing psychiatrist and it's it's relatively rare that I admit somebody involuntarily to the hospital to prevent suicide, but it happens. And in almost all of those cases, there is of course an assumption that the person in question not only is doing something that is gonna be harmful to them, but that they lack decision-making capacity. And this seems especially problematic in your framework when we think about rights and anti-paternalism, because you might think that if someone is lacking capacity, then um, anti-paternalism really doesn't stick. Um, we're not acting, at least in a hard paternalistic fashion, if we intervene to prevent self-injurious behavior for someone who lacks capacity. That's soft paternalism. Most people think that's okay. And likewise, that their rights might actually be defeated, at least momentarily, by a lack of capacity. My right to freedom of movement might, for example, be limited if I don't have capacity. So I just wonder what you think about that. So I think it's unavoidable, right, that we have to think about capacity. I mean, I think you're right, Brent, that there's no, no sort of way around it, right? Uh, certainly when we think about this um, 
clinically, right, where we're dealing with this individual before us, right, you know, and asking, you know, about, about their um, decision-making competence or their decision-making capacity. We can't avoid that. Um, I guess I would say that my leanings on this question is that there is a tendency, uh, and this goes to population tailoring, I suppose, to overshoot with respect to deeming people lacking in capacity, right? Um, and in particular, I would say that one of the difficulties here is that, you know, uh, you, depending on what clinical community you happen to operate in, um, the fact of contemplating suicide itself is considered evidence of incapacity, right? And that, of course, looks like a kind of, you know, vicious circle of some sort, right? Well, how do we know that we should, you know, uh, involuntarily commit you for your suicidal thoughts? Well, look, you've got suicidal thoughts, but that doesn't seem to, <laughs> that doesn't be a justification, right? That just sort of seems to be uh, uh, to engage in a kind of circular reasoning. So I'm, I'm certainly live, right, to the fact that, yes, we would want to think about, about capacity and so forth, but I think we also want to ensure that our standards for capacity don't beg the question, right, sort of against the prospective rationality of suicide and that we're not overshooting, right, with respect to, uh, you know, um, involuntary commitment or, or any other measure for that matter. I mean, it seems to me that, um, you know, certainly I would say that the history of, of um, uh, pharmaceutical right interventions for suicide um, you know there, there has been a long tradition if you will of, of overshooting the mark right of over inclusivity of, of giving more people you know mood suppressing drugs you know and so forth in the 1950s and 60s probably than than really needed them right and that, that wasn't justified by the lights of, of purported suicidal ideation um, so you're certainly correct I didn't mention it it's got to be you're right it's certainly got to be in the background of both of those factors um, and it also has some, it also is at play, I think, in thinking about biographical welfare, too, because one of the elements that seems to contribute to biographical welfare is, right, having a sense of, of control over one's situation, right, being a locus of control over your condition and over your life, right, so um, overriding, right, a person's, you know, decision making on grounds of incapacity is, I think, uh, a self-contribution, right, or detraction, I suppose, from, from biographical welfare, so no easy answers. <laughs> So Michael, uh, yeah, I actually wanted to raise a sort of methodological question about the framework. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I guess it, to, to get to my question though, it would really help me if you could clarify what you meant um, when you said that uh, these different factors should be thought of as all things being equal conditions. Mm -hmm. If you could just unpack that a little bit and I might follow up. Well, all I mean by that, Dan, is that um, we should think of these as um, operating, right, uh, in a certain way in our deliberation, right? So the fact that we would be violating someone's rights with a certain prevention measure uh, speaks against it, uh, that we wouldn't, would speak in favor of it, uh, that we're doing something, say, at a policy level that happens to pretty closely target, right, persons who are um, entertaining suicide as opposed to, you know, a much wider population that includes lots of people who aren't right that would speak against it so um the thought is just that this you know maybe again maybe the dashboard metaphor is helpful right sort of uh in thinking about the the justifiability of, of suicide prevention measures or policies we should think of these things um as isolatable right factors that speak for or against those um, measures or policies so here's my follow-up thank you for the clarification um so I, I take it that the framework is intended to make the discussion less piecemeal and fragmentary, but by having these sort of six different buckets of considerations that might seem piecemeal and fragmentary, <laughs> and that uh, what we might want uh, from a policymaking point of view is to give some sort of priority to some considerations over others. And so uh, yeah. you know, I can see how resource efficiency was sort of listed last. And uh, I, I didn't think that there was any sort of lexical ordering to these principles. Um, although rights and anti-paternalism does seem to be near the top. Um, and so, you know, I was thinking of a sort of similar kind of critique of Beecham and Childress's uh, principalism that, you know, it gives you autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and 
justice, but it doesn't really tell us, you know, how to operationalize these different considerations when facing specific policies. And I was thinking of a similar kind of concern about just the, the sketch of the framework you've given so far. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as I said, Dan, my, my aims for uh, the presentation were at some level modest, right? In the sense that, as I said, you know, there's no uh, sort of algorithm that I want to plug the, that I think we can sort of plug the six factors into and um, uh, uh, yield, right? Sort of, you know, uncontroversial, you know, uncontroversially correct verdicts or something like that, right? Um, but what I would say, I guess, is that, you know, uh, in terms of the literature being fragmentary, what I was sort of saying about that is sort of, is it's fragmentary in the sense that I think most of the literature that I've encountered on the ethics of suicide prevention sort of starts with, with some method or measure that sort of asks questions about it, right? You know, should we use lithium? Should we, you know, force medication on people? Should we institutionalize? Should we, you know, do, do this, that, or the other thing, you know? Um, you know, of course, it's become a, 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 an important set of ethical questions within educational institutions, right? You know, should we inform parents about, you know, suicidal thoughts that a student reports having, et cetera, okay? Um, and of course, I, I admire and welcome, right, you know, people thinking about the nitty gritty details of those questions, but I think it's also helpful to have a menu of things to, to refer to, right, in thinking ethically about these questions, right? And what I would say is that's what the literature doesn't have, right, is anything like a kind of palette or menu, right, of considerations uh, that we might look to, to try to figure out just what we're talking about, right, to kind of get the conversation um, to, to uh, uh, I guess I'd say sort of push the conversation um, to, to a, a point further down, right, than just sort of, you know, hey, should we do this? And then we sort of talk, talk about the ethics of it. Well, you know, if we look at Cholby's framework, then we kind of can get the conversation going and get some momentum, right, a lot quicker, right, than we would otherwise be able to do. Um, but I also, you know, I think fundamentally a lot of this comes down to, in some ways, the question uh, of, of, of welfare in a way, right? Because I think most, you know, um, most of the reasons that we take ourselves to have to want to prevent suicide our welfarest reasons, right? We think that we're benefiting people, right? We think that by preventing them from doing this, we're, we're benefiting uh, the would-be suicidal agent. And I think that invariably, right, we're gonna have to ask ourselves about, um, you know, what kinds of um, ethically suspect things we're willing to do in the service of people's welfare, right? Um, as you can tell, I, I, I think I have what I hope is a reasonable view that we should perhaps be more willing, right, to do certain things when we think their welfare is definitely and, uh, you know, uncontroversially at risk. But I think there's a tendency to, at the same time, to um, um, be willing to entertain maybe ethically uh, um, objectionable or even odious things in the service of people's welfare that sometimes we should, we should not entertain. Right. I mean, going back again to, you know, the, sort of the zero suicide idea. Right. I don't know how serious people are about this. It's a little hard to tell. But, you know, when I first came upon this, my immediate reaction was, well, you know, we could incarcerate everybody in society and surveil them 24 seven. Right. That would certainly get you to know, zero suicide. But I don't think any of us want that society. Right. You know, so, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves also to what what I mean, I know this is somewhat of a taboo thing to say, but what level of suicidal ideation and prevalence in a society we think is ethically acceptable. I think it's above zero, right? It's not zero, right? So, yeah. Michael, a, 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 a <laughs> question from our attendees. Uh, yeah. Around your, your point about societies trying to minimize reasons for suicide, yeah. and it's pointed out that a sense of thwarted belongingness and sure. isolation have been associated as predictors or actions. When you talk about that society that minimizes suicide, did you have specific things in mind or was it more just a general thought that you were putting forth as a, as a, as a very, maybe very effective and very unpaternalistic way to, to yeah. uh, reduce suicide? Well, look, I think anything that we can do, well, maybe I should say that, maybe we're saying most anything, I'll, I'll qualify that. Most anything that we could do that provides people something that they already have good reason to value that also happens to prevent suicide is probably a really good idea, right? So, you know, in this particular question in the chat about thwarted belongingness and so forth, I mean, I think, you know, we need to be thinking about suicide prevention uh, at a very broad cultural level, right? It seems to me that uh, one of the things that, you know, is being much discussed when it comes to 
uh, suicidality among adolescents and youth, you know, is the prevalence of, you know, internet culture and the degree to which it seems to be isolating and, uh, you know, uh, stand in the way of the formation of more meaningful interpersonal relationships. You know, I think we need to think about things like, uh, you know, unemployment, right, which, you know, seems to be one of the factors, long-term unemployment seems to be one of the factors that contributes to suicidality, uh, quite independent, notably, of, of its impacts on income, right? So being unemployed kind of puts you, you know, at the, at the margins of society in many ways, because, you know, adults work, and if you don't work, you're, you're kind of a persona non grata. Uh, you know, I think we should think about um, other features of, of our societies that encourage, right, uh, higher degrees of meaningful social interaction. Uh, you know, do our communities have sufficient green space? Do they have sufficient public space for people to interact with one another? Do they offer sufficient opportunities for people to, uh, you know, get physical exercise, uh, opportunities for, for self-improvement, self-engagement, you know, informal education? Uh, so all of these things are things that we have good reasons to support quite independently, I think, of, of their impacts on the prevalence of suicidality in populations, but they also probably have positive impacts, right, on the prevalence of, of, of suicidality in, in, in populations, and so we, sh we should welcome these. Uh, you know, the, the, the question asked about thwarted belongingness, yeah, I mean, no doubt, right? Uh, 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 I think uh, it, was, uh, it was you, Gary, who had the, you know, the, the findings about, you know, uh, age, Right, you know, and the prevalence of suicide by age in, in the United States. And it seems to me undeniable that one of the things that's going on there is that um, certain older people don't have strong social ties, particularly, uh, you know, widowed men, right, often find themselves without strong social ties. So, again, you know, if we can do something that, that provides people with greater well being and happens to prevent suicidality, then, you know, all the better. Thanks, Michael. Now we're going to back over to Brent and then to Marie. I'm actually going to cede to Marie if she's ready. All right, we'll go to Marie. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this great talk and, and thoughtful framework. I, I had a, a follow-up question on your prioritized high-cost cases, right? Um, you mentioned sort of weighing whether this would be a moderate harm or um, or not. Uh, based on, you mentioned age, comorbidity, sort of what would be your the factors you think would be? Uh, the basis for that determination. So um, I am pretty strong adherent of what I think of as the, you know, the, the orthodox philosophical view nowadays about the value of a person's death to that person, the, the so-called comparativist view, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what that would say is that what we need to be thinking about is um, comparing right, the life that a person has or would have if they were to end their life, say, due to suicide at a given time, versus the most likely life they would have if they didn't, right, and sort of look to the overall kind of levels of well-being and welfare that um, they would have had in this, in this counterfactual life, okay, the life they would have if they, if they didn't engage in suicide, didn't die in that manner. Um, so, I mean, in terms of factors, uh, you know, that all sort of depends upon you know, what your own views about uh, sort of what makes human lives go well, you know, whether you're sort of thinking of it primarily in, you know, experiential terms, pleasure and pain, whether you think of it in terms of, you know, uh, achievement, goals, um, you know, that sort of thing, uh, whether you think about it in terms of, you know, attaining certain kinds of valuable uh, uh, goods, you know, relationships, knowledge, what have you. Um, I'm not kind of signing on, right, to any of those particular views today. Um, but it does seem to me there's some plausibility just sort of going back to, um, you know, the, the, the biographical welfare point uh, to the thought that uh, we probably shouldn't be as concerned, which isn't to say unconcerned, but as concerned, right, about preventing suicides uh, for persons whose, whose uh, death at a given time due to suicide would probably not result in a life that is much worse or any worse than a longer life for them, right? So, you know, if you've got somebody you know, with advanced stage terminal illness, you might sort of say, well, you know, they should be at liberty to end their lives because uh, among other reasons, um, uh, they don't stand to lose very much, right, by ending their lives when they did, because if they hadn't, they would have lived two more months or three more months or something like that. I think this corroborates, you know, going back to the, the testing of the framework, corroborates our sense that, yeah, we probably should be focused more on youth suicide, right, than among suiciding the elderly. Notice I said more, right? I'm not saying we shouldn't be at all concerned with suicide among the elderly, but probably, right, if what we're concerned about is, is people's welfare, we should be more concerned in general, right, with the suicides of the young. 
Ren? So, Michael, it, it strikes me that there is a tension in your view, and I want to see Probably. How, you, <laughs> how you will address it. So you, you suggest that when we are emphasizing anti-paternalism, we need to give priority to a person's current aims, values, preferences, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But those things are often completely unrelated to assessments of quality of life. Right. I'm, I'm thinking part of it here. Right. Just been rereading reasons and persons and it, promoting our present aims is not always consistent with promoting our self-interest broadly construed because sometimes those things um, don't conduce to each other. And you also suggest that um, when we're thinking about rights and promoting autonomy, we shouldn't prejudge people's reasons for suicide implying that we really can't make quality of life assessments at all. So I, I wonder if uh, it's possible to say that we should prioritize quality of life and promoting a person's current aims, unless those two things just end up being exactly the same. Well, they, it would be a remarkable fact if they coincided perfectly. That's certainly right. Um, so just to, I don't want to, um, um, hammer too much on the biographical welfare point, but I, mean, I think in thinking about the ways in which we intervene, right, um, if we think that our intervention is justified on the basis of the person's long-term welfare, then it seems to me to be clear that, again, our intervention shouldn't make it the case that their long-term welfare is thereby undermined, right? That, that seems to me to be just you know, sort of obviously not a coherent way of thinking about these things. Now, I think that if we are um, suspicious of paternalism, Right? And I certainly would describe myself as suspicious of paternalism in general. Then what we're trying to do is we're trying to engage with the uh, would-be suicidal person um, so as right to either enable or, if necessary, prevent them uh, from making uh, decisions that are not best for them by their own lights. Right? And of course, that requires, as you point out, a whole lot of delicacy in trying to figure out what they themselves would think of as best by their own lights. Okay. Um, and we probably have to do some things or should do some things to at least invite them to think in a longer term way about um, whether a suicide at a given point in their lives would in fact be in their lifetime well-being interests. Right. So, you know, classic sorts of cases. You know, I think a lot of us would say we have pretty strong reasons to want to prevent the suicide of a 17 year old, uh, you know, person who is reeling from their first romantic breakup. Why? Well, it feels bad in the moment, but it won't feel that bad in a month or six months or, you know, in 10 years, it might well be completely forgotten. Right. Um, and so I think we do have to invite agents to think about what their long-term interests are, and we have to make reasonable projections about how they would respond, right, to uh, the passage of time, right? Um, so again, you know, uh, there's no, I, I don't put forth the framework as offering kind of easy answers for those kinds of questions. But one thing I do think is important is that we shouldn't, simply by virtue of the fact that someone gives us a reason to think that they're engaging in suicide, discount their current preferences values and commitments on that basis, right? Um, I would also point out there's the perverse possibility that uh, if you were a, uh, if you are a psychiatrist, uh, if you really took seriously, right, acting in people's best interests, psychiatrists should also sometimes be asking people why they aren't contemplating suicide, right? And I don't know of too many psychiatrists who do that, right? Because if we're really thinking that we're acting in their best interest, there might occasionally be cases where we should be, you know, thinking, hmm, maybe their the person's life would be better for being shorter. So. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, this very stimulating, fascinating discussion. Uh, Michael's framework, I, I imagine, uh, themes from it will emerge again in our upcoming conversations. Uh, let's now uh, take a, a five minute break uh, or six minute break and resume at 1135. See you then. Oh, Michael, 
Michael, uh, could you please take down your slides? Yes, sir. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. 
Yeah, hello. <laughs> so um, we're back and now we're about to um, have the first of two talks by our guests who are MD PhDs, who are physician philosophers uh, with PhDs in philosophy and or in ethics and uh, in in uh, and also practicing physicians. So uh, who, who specialize in psychiatry. So uh, next up, we I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Marie Nicolini, who's incoming assistant professor of psychiatry at UT Southwestern. Uh, Marie is also a senior researcher um, at the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Law at KU Movin, um, and also a visiting scholar at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown. Um, Dr. Nicolini is going to be speaking with us today about the tension between suicide prevention and uh, physician assisted uh, suicide. So, um, as you can see from the slide, it's <laughs> now up. Uh, so, I'll pass the baton to Marie. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much for this introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here today with you. Today, I will talk about the tension between suicide prevention on one hand and physician assisted suicide on the other, right? And more in particular, the question of how do we justify preventing suicide in some cases and assisting suicide in other um, in, in jurisdictions, in countries that allow for both options at the same time. And before we get to the program for today, I'll say three brief points for some, some background. So first, I'm a psychiatrist an ethicist and was training, I was trained in Belgium. Belgium is one of the few countries in the world that allows for assisted death for any medical condition. So both terminal disease, but also non-terminal conditions, chronic disabilities, as well as the more controversial cases of depression and dementia. I was not a provider of assisted death, but I often saw and treated patients who requested, who made a request for assisted death in a country where this was an option. Um, and I was called as a psychiatric consultant, either in people who were terminally ill as well as in, in, in non-terminal ill cases. I'm someone who is sympathetic to assisted death in, in terminal illness, um, but when it comes to non-terminal illness, there really, there was and still is a lot of confusion about really how uh, physicians and, and how legislators really, how we should think about going about those requests. So second, this is what led me to do research uh, in this area, and I have since then published over 10 papers, research papers on this practice, uh, looking at what the practice actually looks like, what the empirical facts are, and, and what the main ethical and philosophical questions are that arise. And third, as we see now in Canada, this is obviously, it's a timely question, Canada is grappling with this very question right now. And I've testified to the Canadian Parliament on this issue, and I'll use in, in what follows, I'll start with the, the Canadian debate because Canada is a, is a good case to think through this question because it started with a law that was limited to terminal illness and then has been since then uh, gradually increasing it uh, to, in, to include non-terminal conditions and now is having an active debate about mental illness. And so I'll, I'll focus on this problem to see like how we can make sense of the, the debate that is quite heated, as we see uh, online, on social media and in the press, where we have arguments from autonomy on one side and strong uh, social justice arguments and disability critique on the other, and sort of how we can make sense of this, what we can learn for the debate about assisted death, and what we can learn for suicide prevention as well. So with this, here is the overview for today. So I'll first talk about what is the tension really about, right? And the tension between assisting, um, preventing suicide on one hand and assisting suicide on the other, uh, and why the attempts to address this tension so far have failed. Second, I identify a central problem, a deeper problem of incoherent moral frames, which I argue is under-recognized and which leads to, to uh, downstream problems in policy. And, and three, I'll, I'll articulate ways to move forward, uh, how the debate can move forward and how we can use this um, in suicide prevention to think about how we can improve suicide prevention. I'll start here with a note on terminology because it's confusing. There are many different terms out there um, and they mean different things. People have different reasons to use different terms. So here I'll, I'll use physician-assisted death as an umbrella term to include both 
physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. Now, I'll briefly say what each of these are. So physician-assisted suicide is when a person requests, um, makes a request for a lethal drug, physician prescribes it, but then the person ingests it on their own. While in euthanasia, in what we call active voluntary euthanasia, a person makes a request and the physician prescribes the lethal drugs and, they, and injects it through a, a, an injection. Now, there is a difference between assisted suicide and euthanasia. Uh, and for the purpose of this talk, I'll, I'll focus on physician assisted suicide so we don't get distracted about the euthanasia uh, issue. Because really, when we're talking about this issue, we're contemplating them together. But for the purpose here, I'll, I'll focus on, on physician assisted suicide. Uh, the states in the US, some of the states that do allow for physician assisted death in terminal illness, allow only for physician assisted suicide and not euthanasia, right? So this is for terminology. And so the key question for today is to think about how can how do we justify preventing suicide in one hand, and so focusing on taking away the means, right? And at the same time, assisting suicide in others, where we actually provide the lethal means. And I... I want to clarify here what the thread is going to be. I, I want to focus on what I'll call the real tension, which is the tension between suicide prevention and physician assisted suicide in non terminal chronic conditions. Now, the reason I call this the real tension is I'm going to bracket the question of assisted death in terminal illness, right? Uh, there is lots of discussion about whether. Assisted death in terminal illness should be called suicide, whether it should be called um, aid in dying, right, or death with dignity. Um, but there is no question that it's a matter of hastening death, right? Someone, and we've heard uh, some of it right before, um, where it's it's a matter of hastening a process that's already underway, right? And so I'll I'll bracket this because you know we can we can say well maybe that's not. Where we can say maybe that doesn't fall under suicide, even if it would fall under a, a strict definition, right, of bringing, intentionally bringing one's own death. But I'll focus instead on really what's the elephant in the room, which is non-terminal illness or disability, right? And this is an area that, that has been neglected, actually, both in research as well as at the policy level, because a lot of discussions have focused on terminal illness, like they do in, in the U.S., um, or straight to the more controversial applications of non-terminal illness like mental disorders or like dementia, right? But sort of forgetting that there is this huge group of people, right? And a vast majority of people uh, who are not strictly, who don't have a prognosis of less than six months, uh, but still would fall under the law and can make a request. Okay, so moving on then to what is detention about? I'll start here. So, right. So, the, to illustrate sort of what the tension is, imagine a person with a chronic condition, let's say multiple sclerosis or chronic kidney disease in Canada, right? Um, and, or in Belgium or in the Netherlands, right? And they, they want to die. Now, there are two different approaches. And, and I have to say, both come from a place of compassion, right? Like, as we're talking about those two policies, uh, the, motiv the motivation really is one of compassion. But the question is, well, how should this work in practice, right? So one approach for someone who wants to die and at, you know, attempt suicide, right, or is serious about thinking about suicide, is to prevent suicide at all costs, um, including with voluntary treatment, right? So that's, that's one approach. The other one in a country like Canada is to provide help with suicide, right? So if we think, for example, so North Carolina doesn't have a physician-assisted death law, right? So in North Carolina, there is no, uh, even if someone's terminally ill, it's not an option. But if someone is in Vermont or in Oregon in the US, they have that option if they're terminally ill, not if they're not terminally ill. But if they cross the border to Canada, then these are the two options that clinicians sort of have to weigh, right? So that's, that's the question. Then if we look at, okay, what does what does the standard bioethics textbook say about this, right? Uh, we see here Beecham and Childress say, quote, although suicide has been decriminalized in most countries, a suicide attempt, irrespective of motive, almost universally provides a legal basis for public officers to intervene, as well as grounds for at least temporary involuntary hospitalization. Right, so they're they're saying 
suicide has been decriminalized, right? Because um, historically it was considered a crime, then most countries now have decriminalized it. Um, and But they're doing a good job of bringing together sort of how across different fields, right? Medicine, law, law enforcement, this is sort of the basis. If someone attempts suicide, we're not looking at their motives. We're not testing their capacity or assessing their capacity, but where the assumption of those policies is we, uh, there is uh, universally a legal basis to intervene. And as a, as a side note, right? So with suicide in the law, and this is, this is very brief, but has gone from being a crime, right? To being considered sort of by default, a mental illness. Right. And so there is that dichotomy of the bad or the mad, which doesn't really allow right for the, the 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 option that we think is plausible that there can be a rational suicide. That's neither bad nor mad. But we can see that in practice, though, the policies are very much into that dichotomy thing, right? Because they kind of assume there is a mental illness or incapacity that justifies intervening. Um, and really the response, especially, I mean, he, this is from, from in the US, right? In Massachusetts, for example, um, if one calls 911, which now would be um, 988, right? There could be police intervention that includes SWAT teams, right? And if you see here the, the chart of their, of this uh, Massachusetts SWAT activities, Suicide related interventions are up there with other crimes, right? I mean, with, with crimes. Uh, suicide isn't one, but it's considered, right? Uh, one along with drug related crimes, and we see terrorism. Um, and, and there is no question that interve intervention is sometimes um, is violent and, uh, and perhaps overkill. So, uh, what are the assumptions, right, under, underneath these, these policies? There is what we can see is right, and we've we've heard some of this, right? Is that well, suicide? If someone's suicidal, there's a sort of circular reasoning that because someone's suicidal, they must have mental illness, and mental illness equal incapacitated, right? And so, ethically speaking, we would think, well, it's it's a person's incapacity that justifies involuntary treatment, right, or treatment over objection. Um, but really, it sort of uh, gets condensated to, well, so if someone's suicidal, then intervention is justified, like in that quote from Beecham and Childress. Now, coming then to the debate about, okay, how, how should we make sense of this versus we're sometimes actually helping people, right? So how do we come from that one type of scenario to, to then, okay, sometimes we think it's justified and we assist people. And here is sort of the, the standard uh, approach that we see for addressing the tension, which I'll argue doesn't, uh, doesn't succeed in, in, in addressing it. But the standard approach so far has been to say there is no tension because there is a difference between suicide and physician assisted death. And this is uh, from the Canadian Center for Suicide Prevention. And the American Association of Suicidology has sort of says, said the same. And it's something that we, we keep on seeing uh, as the Canadian debate is unfolding. unfolding. Um, we see this over and over also on social media, right? So it's a very uh, pervasive argument. And what it says is, and I'll, I'll say here sort of immediately what I think is a problem, right? Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that really it actually neglects what I call the real question because it almost universally focuses on end of life, right? So it makes an argument about, well, there's a difference. And that difference may well hold when it comes to terminal illness, but it's unclear whether that also applies to non-terminal illness, right? So what it says here, for example, is that suicidal people do not usually want to die. Uh, they want to end the pain of living or they, yeah, they want the pain of living to end. Um, and then they say people seeking assisted death want to hasten death. They want the suffering in dying to end. So this is very clearly, right? We see like a hospital bed and the wording is about, this is about hastening death. It's about someone who already is dying, right? Um, so that doesn't actually address the real question. So that's one major concern with this. The second though, and perhaps more important is that it relies on a misguided assumption about suicide and rationality, right? So it says suicide is often impulsive, it's violent, it's carried out alone, it leaves loved ones with devastating grief, while assisted death, it says, is often planned, 
peaceful, carried out in the presence of loved ones and is a deliberate process. Now, two problems with this. One is that, and this I've, I've said, right? So it neglects the question and it's, but two problems within the misguided assumption about rationality and suicide is that the first is that it really relies on this assumption that suicidality equals impulsive. And what, what we mean by impulsive is actually irrational, right? Now that is actually, it's, it's false to assume, right? That that is the standard or the rule rather than the exception, right? And my colleagues and I have published this uh, recently, really suicidology literature shows that majority of people's suicidal processes are not out of the blue or impulsive, even among those with mental disorders, right? So what, what they say might be true for what we would call the acutely suicidal, and it might be true for a small, for a percentage, but it's, it's, it's false to assume that it covers everyone with mental disorders, right? Like a lot of people include, who have a mental disorder think about suicide chronically, right? Or what we call chronically suicidal. And for they would meet, they would be considered rational, right? They would meet a bar for capacity in, in what we would sort of conventionally call uh, rational. The broader issue coming back to our what's our real question here is that if we look at people with chronic disabilities or disorders, physical disabilities, right? The vast majority of people who are, this is a quote from Susan Stephan says, quote, the vast majority of people who are thinking about suicide, attempting suicide and committing suicide, which we would say die by suicide, now, are nowhere close to incompetent under our current legal standards, right? So this is bringing back the, the, the issue to the non-terminal chronic, physical and perhaps mental, but right, that vast, vast majority of group, which of people who would meet actually the, the bar for what we call competence. So it, it, it doesn't really assess, it doesn't really address the tension, right? Because it neglects the real question, which is about what we do with those, with the chronic layer, uh, and it relies on these misguided assumptions. So with that in mind, I'll move on to the second part, right, which is the central problem, what I take to be the central problem in, in this debate. And it's it gets, as I said earlier, quite heated because if we think, if we look at the Canadian debate, because there are two sides which don't really feel like they address each other's concerns, right? So those who say, well, it's an argument about autonomy, and those who say, look, um, there are charges of discrimination, right, of, of uh, ableism, they're saying, look, you're not thinking this true, this is actually discrimination against people with disabilities. And um, they can't really um, address each other's concern and sort of it's, it's, it risks not being in a deadlock, right, not being able to move forward. So what I take to be the central problem here is that there is an incoherence in moral frames, the moral frames that are used for suicide prevention and the ones used for physician assisted suicide. And that if we don't recognize that, it's bound to lead to downstream confusion at the policy level. And in fact, that is what we see as I'll, um, as I'll outline um, in a second. So here is, here is the, the, the gist of it. And I'll, I'll use these as uh, the, the frames as, um, as a shorthand, right? But we can say that by and large, suicide prevention goes by a deontology frame where death is a harm. And I'll say in a second what, what that is. Physician assisted suicide, though, in the literature is a, a hybrid model of deontology in a utilitarian frame where death is not always a harm, right? And the issue is that and we it's a it's a patchwork, right? And uh, we cannot, the two cannot coherently coexist. So we need to really figure out sort of what can be one coherent moral frame for, for both, if we're gonna like Canada and like Belgium and the Netherlands have one government do both. So suicide prevention. Now, I have to say it's not often uh, actually made explicit that way, right? But we can sort of understand it as a deontology frame in the sense of that one that's grounded in respect for the worth of persons. Right? And that means that um, a person is never to use oneself merely as a means to an end, right? And that death by suicide is a wrong because it violates the requirements of the respect for the worth of persons, right? 
and death is a harm in that thing. So basically, I mean, as we see in the way suicide prevention sort of be, is being done, um, it we're mostly um, trying to prevent all suicides, right, and seeing it as a as a harm. Now, the another another way to see it and to see why death is considered a harm is that intervention is largely based on risk assessment, right? So interventions, including um, assessment of whether someone should be voluntarily committed is really largely based on risk and the presence of mental illness, but there is no actually assessment of a person's autonomy um, in that process. And, and of course, one one problem, and it's not addressed really in, in, in this debate, but or in this in the literature that often, but really a question is if um, it depends on respect for persons, the question is, well, you know, who counts as a person, right? And are we, when we intervene and we do it, right, more often than we probably should, um, do we intervene because we think this is someone who matters as a person and it's in their right, best interest to, um, to intervene, or do we intervene and override their um, preferences because they don't matter as non-persons, because we consider them irrational, right? So this is a major problem, actually, for, um, for suicide prevention as, as it's being done to, to really think about, well, based on what are we actually justifying our intervention? And it's, it's the theme of, of today, right? Um, but if we look at, at a policy sort of what, for example, the World Health Organization says. Now, they don't make it explicit in, in this report, which is their latest report on, on preventing suicide. They don't make their sort of ethical frame explicit. Uh, we can see they use the language like a global imperative, right? So the report really much is, is very focused on, well, every suicide has to be prevented. Um, but but the assumption is they have a sort of common sense view of persons where they're assuming everyone counts as a person, right? And, and every suicide should be prevented. Um, so, so that's sort of what we see. As, as was said earlier, um, it's, it's, it is really a patchwork. So, so this is sort of what we see, and it's kind of disconnected from the literature on physician-assisted suicide. So when it comes to physician-assisted suicide, it sort of adds that utilitarian component where it, it still says, well, yes, we should, you know, yes, we, as a matter of policy and practice, we're committed to suicide prevention, um, but it, it adds that utilitarian component, which says that a right action is determined by its consequences. And a strictly utilitarian component uh, frame would say relief of suffering is really the only thing that's intrinsically valuable, not the respect for persons. Um, but in this hybrid model, which we will see uh, also applies in, in Beecham and Childress, the idea is, well, suffering can be so severe that it reverses the harm of death, and so that death by suicide is not always a harm. And so here are some quotes from, from uh, Beecham and Childress saying, suffering, suffering can ravage patients so severely that death is in their best interest. And death by physician assisted suicide as a last resort, they say, is not always wrong, right? So they really say as a last resort. It's not merely a fact of um, a matter of uh, assessing whether they suffer, right? So there, there is that hybrid thing going on. And they say caring physician, caring physician, assist, physician assistance in hastening death is, they say, part of a continuum of medical care. So what they do here, and this is sort of what we see over and over really, is that it actually neglects the real issue, right? Because it really focuses on hastening death in the terminal illness context, right? And it doesn't really address, it doesn't connect it to the tension with suicide prevention. It leaves that unaddressed. And it leaves the question open, open of, is that bad or not always bad, right? And how should one make that determination? So, because there is that central problem, this is this is my view that there is a central problem that's under recognized, and and this is why we see downstream confusion in in policy in countries that have to sort of figure out this very question, right? So coming back to a physician who has right who is a say at the ER has a patient who comes with a chronic condition who wants to die who perhaps even attempted attempted suicide, right? Should they 
activate suicide prevention measure, measures? Should they refer the patient to a provider for further, right? So that very sort of practical decision that they're asked to make. So if we look at what policy says uh, and whether that's a solution to the question, right? We can look at, uh, here's a quote from the, the Canadian expert panel report on medical assistance in dying. So this uh, came out in 2022, and actually the, the recent report of the Canadian government that came out a month ago quotes this as well. And so, so here they're saying, they're, they're acknowledging that it's an issue, right? Uh, including in, 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 again, chronic physical conditions or multiple people with mul multiple disabilities, right? Uh, they're saying, yeah, these are high stake clinical situations. And they're saying in these high stake clinical situations, a clinician must undertake, they say, three actions simultaneously. One is to consider a capacity, a person's capacity to provide informed consent to make such decisions. So that's their, the first, is assess capacity. Second is consider whether or not suicide prevention measures should be activated, including against the will of the person if necessary and consider what other types of intervention could be helpful to the person, including non-intervention. Right, so that's, that's what, they're, what they're saying. Now, the problem here is that it starts with a focus on capacity assessment. And, and of course, the idea of a capacity assessment, which is the central aspect of informed consent, right? We have information, capacity, and, and voluntariness. But really, we think in bioethics, about capacity as the one component that tracks rationality, right? So they're saying, basically what they're saying is make that distinction between rational and irrational and filter out those that are irrational, right? Um, except of course, coming back to our real question, many people, especially chronically ill who are not, who don't have a mental disorder will, will pass that capacity assessment, right? So it's really, it's unclear how much that will filter out. So that's, that's the first point. And the second issue is that the recommendation to, quote, assess whether to provide suicide prevention or not, right, whether to activate one or the other, doesn't really address the question. It actually circles back to the real tension, because that's the, the question we started with, is based when, based on what should you make that determination? So... And so what I, what I, what in my view, what I, the way I see it is that in reality, what they're asking clinicians to do with this recommendation, and you know, the Dutch say something similar, um, is they ask clinician to switch gears between those moral frames, right? And you know, they're talking to clinicians who are trained in a certain way to do suicide prevention, and then they're saying, well, when you have someone right uh, in that situation, well switch to that other frame. And that, of course, is bound one to lead to moral distress, right? Because I mean, many clinicians, first, don't necessarily have settled views on this question, and, and many people actually don't. And as we see, the field actually uh, hasn't really focused on this, right? So it's really almost an impossible task to ask clinicians to know what to do. And then, and then the question is, well, based on what are they are they to decide whether harm is a whether death is a harm or not, and and really whether to prescribe a lethal means or whether to do activate suicide prevention, where they would be out um, to to remove right the means and and uh, and activate the other measures. And so, really, we're back to the real tension, right? Which is the tension between suicide prevention and and assisted suicide in chronic conditions, and we can kind of understand the why the debate is so heated in in Canada right and, and this is a cartoon that has um, been circulating and sort of uh, illustrates the charges of ableism discrimination that the disability critique is making by saying look you're offering an option that you offer only to those who have chronic disabilities because the law for assisted suicide uh, requires the presence of a condition, any medical condition, but there has to be a medical condition, right? So they're they're sort of saying, well, look, you're making a ramp and making right um, access easy for assisted suicide, and on this thing, you have to be able body to um, to access suicide prevention, and and really, we can understand that part of the pushback is sort of perhaps unconsciously, right? But um, a pushback against, well, that 
utilitarian frame that comes in and that's different right from the way suicide prevention is done uh, and where we sort of take that respect for persons per se out of the equation right um and so with this it's it's a it's we see in canada that it's a, a deadlock, right? Like an impasse. And it's one that we see in Canada now, but that the US um, perhaps, you know, is likely to see in the future, right? At least the states that have some type of assisted death uh, will likely face the question of, well, should it be expanded to non-terminal illness, right? So this is really a question for the future at a global level, right? And this sign here, um, which is also the title of a book, it means the impasse of a of the, the future, right? So, uh, and, and I think it's quite suitable because it's it's really a problem that both the countries that are already in the impasse have to solve, uh, but also the ones that can expect it, I expect to see it. So how do we move forward then from this impasse? I'll discuss the two the two implications, right? One for us to death and then what we can really learn about suicide prevention, right? Including for a state like North Carolina that doesn't have a, a physician assisted death law, right? But what can we learn about this particular question? So in terms of assisted death debate, what I would say is that it should stop relying on these stereotypical um, and harmful assumptions about suicidality. And I'm saying harmful because um, often in trying to make that point that suicide is different from assisted death, not only does it say, well, suicide is irrational, so, you know, it, it's just, it, it's a different thing. Um, and it actually also sort of suggests, there is an undertone suggesting it's immoral in the sense, you know, when they say, well, it, suicide is something people do secretively behind the backs of their families. It's nothing compared to what, you know, how people engage with their families in assisted death. And it sort of misses the point that, first of all, it's not always true. And second, there are reasons why people also feel um, scared or ambivalent to actually call uh, or ask for help, right? Um, and we've seen sort of the knee-jerk response, right, that often occurs. So it's there are many reasons and many motivations for why someone might, you know, not engage in a deliberative process, even with their clinicians, right? So, so I don't think it's helpful to actually use those um, assumptions, particularly because it doesn't actually get us to what the real question, right? And what we should instead do is recognize that the field, and by that I mean, right, bioethics, philosophers, the law, right, we have not, and medicine has not addressed the real question thoroughly, right, and sort of always falls short and, and stops at terminal illness. And, and that we should instead address the problem of moral incoherence and figure out um, a frame that would be coherent. Now, of course, that would mean, I mean, roughly that could mean two different things, right? Either we could say, well, we can stick to that roughly the ontology frame we have, um, and then sort of see, test whether what kind of applications of assisted death would fall under that. Um, that's one, right? But we need to be explicit about that. And, and of course, actually solve the issues of, well, who does it pertain to, right? Like the two-tiered sort of account of persons. The other one is to say, well, we stick to that hybrid model of deontology and, and, and utilitarianism, but that actually requires changing the way we do suicide prevention in practice, right? It requires changing training clinicians receive, changing, right, what WHO says. Um, so it's, it's, we can't be sort of um, satisfied with it being um, a paragraph in a report, right? It's like much, much more substantial than that. It would require an overhaul really of the way we do suicide prevention. And then to conclude, what can we learn for suicide prevention, right? And of course, I mean, many more people think about suicide, engage in suicidal activity than the people who request assisted death. So, so this really uh, is an important issue. One I would say first is to address the quote irrational aspect of suicide prevention policies, right? So it's one thing to have an overarching frame. Um, it's another to actually apply policies sort of right overdoing it in practice and having this knee jerk reaction uh, of right of calling the police or in general sort of actually communicating that we don't really want to talk about suicide, right? So we're we're 
encouraging people to say call 911 or 988 right do call something clinicians refer patients to the ER right there is often the knee jerk thing of do something right um but but that actually sort of conveys that well you know we, we it's so so weighty that we can't even talk about it even professionals right and i'm saying in general because of course a lot of people do good work right um but there is much much that can be improved in terms of how we make uh, suicide prevention accessible and, and sort of a safe space for people. And so we can really learn, I think, from this debate because we, we see that in this debate, we can actually talk about suicide and about possibility of rational suicide, right? There is a space where, where we can do that, right? So we should learn from that and sort of make this talking about also the harder cases and the harder questions sort of um, more common. And and then coming to suicide prevention itself, it's this, this, this tension really shows that we need to clarify the reasons that we have to justify the course of action that is taken. And I'm, I'm thinking about the hard cases, right, where we override a person's decision. Even if, if we were to do a capacity assessment, they would probably meet the bar, right? So ethically speaking, based on what are we um, what are the reasons to justify this? And, and so it, it shouldn't be only on risk assessment, the way it's sometimes sort of done or focus on, well, you know, how likely it is that someone, you know, will die. And we know there are problems with, with the reliability of such assessments, right? But it's very much this narrow focus. And ethically speaking, we should really think about that broader picture. And I'll uh, stop here and I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Marie, uh, for, for your paper and uh, for your talk. And uh, the, um, the topics definitely bring forward some of the things that came up uh, from our earlier conversations. But um, I'm just sort of prattling on a bit to uh, wait for some uh, responses to come in from our participants and uh, to keep track of the queue. So it looks like our first uh, question is from Gary. Marie, great talk, and I think you've highlighted just how uh, much of attention there is in these two practices of suicide prevention versus physician-assisted suicide. I, I'll say that um, my practice in psychiatry has been for many years in severely medically ill individuals, and about 80% of my practice is in pre- and post-transplant patients. And one of the things I've observed over the years is that um, with people, I'm thinking here of people on dialysis would be a classic example. Mm -hmm. um, about 70% of those people stop dialysis and never see a mental health professional. They merely negotiate that out with their nephrologist that they no longer want to live where they have to sit uh, with half of their blood volume out of their body three times a week. And I have come to the point where I, I don't consider that suicide anymore. Uh, I, I consider those folks making a decision that they just don't want to live that way. Um, and it's interesting because you, I've seen that both with that and with the left ventricular assist device patients as well, who no longer want to live with this machine coming out of their body. And I just wonder if you have thoughts about that. And, and it, it leads to a slightly extended is um, how chronic or severe a medical condition do you have to have to qualify for physician-assisted death? And I think your, your, your cartoon about the dilemma of people with disabilities really highlights um, the question of whether or not you need to even have one of those conditions to request physician-assisted death. And, and I'll stop there, or should have one of those conditions is what I mean. Thank you. Thank you for this question and for bringing also your uh, experience working as a psychiatrist to this, um, to the fore. So in terms of a person we might think of with uh, in, who has dialysis or any other kind of uh, situation of refusing treatment really, right? Like refusing life-sustaining treatment, it could fall under that bucket, right? Um, so I take it, and I'm not saying this is what you say, right? But 
one could say, well, it's it's actually morally equivalent, and people have said that, right? They're like, well, we we allow people to refuse um, further life sustaining treatment, so why shouldn't we allow, right, um, assisted death? And the, the truth is that in, I mean, again, it depends, right? Like if in a utilitarian frame, we can say, yeah, they're they're morally equivalent. Um, I'll say that Beecham and Childress sort of, well, they're kind of ambivalent themselves. They're saying even in those end of life situations, they say, well, on one hand, they say, well, they, they're kind of morally equivalent, but they're not perfectly analogous because they're saying there is a strong uh, duty to refuse a treatment, like to, to respect a treatment refusal, and there is no corresponding duty to actually provide assisted death, right? So the analogy works only to a certain extent. And I guess I would say, though, it, it again, doesn't necessarily uh, address the real question, because that still sort of applies. I mean, it, it's an in-between case, right? But it, it implies that someone who stops dialysis will not live long. Right. Uh, and really, the vast majority of, I mean, the discussion in Canada right now and what this question is, is is outside of that terminal uh, illness thing. So so this is some it starts with a chronic disability, but it's someone who it's really it becomes an end of life situation if someone stops treatment. So for me, even if one can make um, a convincing argument there, it still fails to sort of make the point for why refusing treatment would be the same as providing assisted death in someone who you know, is in a wheelchair outside of the hospital, for example. Thanks, Marie. I'm keeping track of the queue and we're gonna to go to Brent next and then we have some folks uh, from our attendees. Marie, thanks for a really lucid talk. So you, you do a good job of illustrating a tension between these two practices. I agree that tension exists. You attribute the tension to competing moral frameworks that are um, not consistent with each other, consequentialism and deontology. And I, I want to sort of try to compel you to say what you actually think the answer ought to be. Mm -hmm. So... What's the right moral framework to use to think about these different policies? How should we think about suicide prevention? Should we be deontologist or consequentialist, perhaps? Uh, how should we think about physician-assisted suicide? And given that framework, your preferred framework, what's the answer? Should we permit physician-assisted suicide for non-terminal and especially mental illness? Well, you're asking several questions in one here. I don't know if that's allowed. No, I'm kidding. It's it's a tough it's a tough issue, a tough question. So, um, I would be sympathetic to a sort of broad stroke deontology frame if it weren't for that two tiered um, approach of personhood, right? Which I think is really a problem because it's really unclear whether those who are irrational would fall. I mean, it it sounds like they would fall. Um, they wouldn't fall within um, the um, cases that we would prevent. Um, I mean, or we would prevent them, but not because they matter as persons. Um, and and that, of course, is a is a is a is a major issue. So, I, I would, um, in terms of which one is the better one, I'm not sure I have um, a satisfying answer. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I think the hybrid model could work, um, but only if we really think through what what it means. And I will say to respond to your second question, though, that you know, sh should this be permitted or not? I think, given the way things stand, I, I would say no, though. Uh, because we really have to think what it means. Uh, even if we want to commit to that hybrid model, we still have the problem of, uh, and we need to respond to those charges of discrimination, right? Or in some go as far as saying eugenics, right? Like as a matter of policy, how is that going to work out? So, um, so that would be my answer. It would be sir, It would be pretty clear. You no, know, uh, draw, drawing a distinction between terminal illness um, and non-terminal illness, and sort of, yeah. Marie, the series of questions. The next one up is a distinction between fully formed adult brains and adolescent brains. And do we need a, in essence, a split policy that takes into account the fact of rational decision making and impulsivity in adolescence is not what it is in adults? That's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, I 
I would say short answer would be yes, I think. Uh, it, I th this is another instance where actually the debate about assisted death can be useful because um, minors is one of the one of the sort of more controversial aspects where a lot of discussion has gone through, right? To to think about well, if if we allow for assisted death based on a, any dis mental disorder or another disorder, um, does that include minors, right? And uh, does that include mature minors, right? There is that distinction. Um, now, I, I want to say because this gets in. I'm, this gets into a sort of uh, territory that I realize is sort of jarring, right? right? If we think about assisted death or euthanasia in, in young people. So I, I don't wanna, but I'm just merely as a, as a theoretical issue, bringing it up um, and saying that actually, even in countries in Belgium and the Netherlands where this is uh, permitted, not, not based on a mental disorder, right? But based on something else, um, there really are very little cases like, and there's a lot of pushback. And so I think the general, I mean, the general sort of gist is that most people, including there, are on board that, you know, it, it's a it's a sort of different uh, ballgame when it comes to adolescence and, and that we need to take that into account, the whole, you know, developing brains and impulsivity. So I would say, I would say yes. Thanks, Marie. The, the next question takes us back to this complicated area of disability justice, anti-ableism, and a balance between compassion and eugenics. And, and I think it's, as you pointed out, the tension here of only bringing the debate to the terminally ill, that once you expand it, things become more complicated. Could you say some more about this issue around disability justice and anti-ableism? Yeah, that's a great question. I I, I think my, my the main thing I want to say is that there is a sort of erasure that's been happening by the very fact that this whole question has been um, neglected in the assisted death debate, right? And, and that in itself is really is a big problem, right? So with in, in countries that um, allow like Belgium and the Netherlands for any medical conditions, even back then, because we're talking about 20 years ago when the laws were passed, it, it started from terminal illness and then it sort of went straight to the, the um, controversial questions of mental disorder. And, 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 you know, that sort of um, jeopardizes an actual discussion about this, right? So there is, I think it's twofold, right? The worry from the disability community is one, like, hey, like, why aren't we talking about this as much as we should? And second, you know, what, what are the assumptions, right, that you're making in terms of the lives of, you know, the, the, um, of our, the worth of our, of our lives? Um, and, and it's to a certain extent what we see in Canada as well, right, where there's been a lot of discussion about terminal illness, and as soon as the court uh, case struck down the terminal disease requirement, um, it's it's been really mostly focusing on on mental illness, on dementia, on major minors. But this this elephant in the room question has been relatively unaddressed. So so that would be um, my my you know my response. Like first attention and from the field, including from bioethics, right? Like there is why why are we neglecting this question? Thanks, Bree. Now we're going to go over to Michael. Oh, good. Thanks, Marie. Um, just a couple of uh, tidbits from the literature that might be uh, worth consulting, and then just some observations maybe about a slightly different way to, to think about this issue of the tensions between suicide prevention and um, assisted dying. So when I think on the disability question, I mean, I think Ben Colbert and Christopher Riddle have done it as well as anyone to you know, sort of uh, highlight that, you know, there's a lot of different opinions among disability advocacy groups about, you know, assisted dying uh, and uh, that we shouldn't um, assume that um, spokespersons for those uh, communities uh, that claim that those communities um, hold uh, positions antithetical to, to legal assisted dying, that's sort of actually not true, right? So, I mean, they're kind of self-appointed spokespersons in many cases. Um, but on this general question of, of the tension that you're identifying. So I've had the chance to interact with a lot of assisted dying advocacy groups, right? And what and what they will say, not so much publicly, but you know, in conversation, is something like this. So if you want to advocate for uh, the legalization of assisted dying in societies that have the values that you, Marie, were talking about, you have to find a way to frame the issue without reference to suicide. 
right? Because you have, you know, the presumption uh, that suicide is uh, something that, that, you know, medical professionals, institutions, whatever, have a duty to prevent. So if you're going to, to make any political headway, right, you have to enter into the conversation by representing it in another way, mm -hmm. right? And what they will be very candid about is, you know, over time, their language has evolved away definitely away from talking about suicide as what it is that they're advocating for and ad, uh, instead saying that what they're advocating for is dignity in dying, aid in dying, right? So notice all the emphasis falls on dying, right? And the idea that what it is that they're advocating for is people's right to determine the circumstances of their own death, mm -hmm. right? But in a bit limited way, right? If you're already, so to speak, at death's door, you have the terminal illness, then, you know, we're going to afford you the right to determine, you know, just how that's going to happen. Right, whether by you know your cancer or your terminal disease, or uh, through you know your your physician aiding you by providing you a lethal medication or whatever, and I, I raise this because I think that you know it's worth sort of keeping in mind kind of the cultural politics against which you know the advocacy of assisted dying has taken place, because again they want to distance themselves from suicide as a term, right, as a concept, but I think it has the upshot uh, that you are identifying, right, which is that it then makes the question of non-terminal illness difficult to entertain because then we're not talking about a question of, you know, well, do you have the right to determine you know, how you're going to die, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Then the question just doesn't extrapolate, right, to the cases of, of the non-terminally ill, right? So, I mean, it, this isn't really sort of a challenge to your paper, but it's just sort of a kind of set of observations about how the issue has been framed in order to um, create, right, the kind of and a partition between these two, you know, sets of practices and policies and so forth that you're identifying. I think it's mostly political, right, to try to, you know, siphon off, right, or, or, or detract, right, um, uh, from uh, assisted dying as a, as a form of suicide, right, because right. that, you know, is kind of a, is a political loser in a lot of societies. Right, right. So, right. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. It's, I don't know if you want to offer any comment on that, but I, I no, think no, I can comment on that. There's, 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 you know, philosophical thinking going on here, but I also right. think there's just sort of politics, frankly, you know. Of course, yeah, and I think <laughs> part of what we're saying in Canada, of course, uh, is is also politics. No, and I appreciate your comment. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, so yeah, I mean, and you know, part of the reason, I mean, it's pretty clear why people want to avoid the term suicide and the strong connotations it, it has, and and also sort of saying, well, but you know, that might be immoral, but you know, this is is a, is, is is moral. Um, I will I will just say that, and you know, your point is well taken. Of course, disability community has different voices and 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 so on. But but one thing people have said is though the problem you encounter in this real tension is that when you turn this into a terminal, um, into an end of life discussion, uh, that in itself, people would say, is a problem, right? Because as long as it's sort of um, terminal illness thing, it's one thing, but to actually say that someone who is in a wheelchair, um, right, and is not dying, and to say that's an end of life, that's a case of medical assistance in dying, um, there is an implicit sort of judgment there as well. I mean, that's how people kind of perceive it. And so that's kind of the, you know, um, I think what you're saying is right. There's been a lot of sort of being careful about how do we want to think about end of life sort of assisted death and not wanting to call it suicide. There is similarly pushback against calling non-terminal condition assisted death uh, aid in dying when it's not about aid in dying, right? And that we shouldn't actually use the term physician as the suicide so that we can actually think about this. So yeah, I appreciate your point about the politics of this. Marie, the next question is around the tension. I'm just going to read the, the question. You argue that moral incoherence results from suicide prevention being based on deontological moral arguments, while physician-assisted suicide is based on both teleological and deontological arguments, i.e. Uh, there are tele teleological arguments for suicide prevention as well. There are teleological arguments. I think the proponents of both commonly make use of a variety of teleological and deontological arguments, and that there is no single argument defending either one. I'm not sure there's a question there as much as it seems a commentary on the view of the, or, the origin of the tension. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm, let's see if I understood it correctly. I mean, there is... 
I think when it comes to physician assisted death or suicide, I, I think there is an argument. I mean, that's what Beecham and Childers, but also De Gracia and, and Milam in their recent book were McMahon. I mean, people have made arguments. Um, so I, um, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not exactly sure. I mean, the problem is though how it's it's worded and 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 in suicide prevention though. I mean, it's it's very hard to see, including in in classic textbooks, sort of what really is the justification, right? It's often merely sort of relying what the law says or what policy does, and then policy sort of doesn't actually refer to a frame. So I, you know, I it's a patchwork. It's it's yeah. Um, I hope this this answers. I I think. There, you know, we can find arguments. The question is, how do we bring them together, and and um, you know, what what work lies ahead of us? Great, Marie. Uh, the next question is, if the true issue is whether death is a harm, why are psychiatrists and other physicians any more qualified to answer that question? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> um, that's true. I mean, that, that you know, um, I guess that goes to the broader question of, you know, why are they, I mean, people say the same about how, how are, you know, are psychiatrists really the right person to think about existential, su about suffering in general? Like, I mean, right, like what falls under the purview of physicians? And, and this clearly, I mean, clearly suicide is a question that goes beyond the boundaries of medicine. So, I mean, point is well taken right and, and and people who say look this shouldn't be up to physicians because they ultimately are the ones who sign off right and I mean that's that's a, a valid point I mean we've sort of as a matter of practice and policy we we treat both within the medical domain both suicide prevention which suicide too is not purely medical of course right and still it falls under the purview of mostly psychiatrists um, and same with assisted death, right? We sort of often in debates, people talk about it as an existential thing that's sort of not like suicide and it's different, but really it's actually within medicine because doctors have to sign off. And so, yeah, that's a, that's a fundamental, yeah, that's a, that's an issue, uh, for, for, for both, um, practices. And Marie, I'll just make a comment that, you know, I think that, um, in the medical model, this is my view anyway, mm -hmm. uh, the co concept of suicide is often at least taught as being the result of mental illness. Right. The mental illness right. is itself causative of the desire to die. Right. And so within a medical framework where your goal is to identify illness and cure it if possible, let's say, uh, by preventing suicide, you are directly addressing a downstream effect of this mental illness. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm not saying we, I'm asking you to comment on that. I'm just saying yeah. that I think that that would be a fairly mainstream view within right. mental health practitioners as to their justification for intervening, at least in some cases, on people who are suicidal. Right where actually the justification for intervening is the incapacity and not the mere presence, like ethically speaking, right? But yeah, no, you're right. And and of course, there's a question of how that factors into the data we have about suicide, because if clinicians assume, right, if you're suicidal, you must have mental illness, it's that circular reasoning. So if anything, I think this tension actually is as much as a call for thinking thoroughly about suicide prevention as it is to think about assisted death. Because a lot of the things that we are taught in medical school actually, you know, don't fully make sense. And are you going to bring us to a conclusion of this session? Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, let's uh, thank Marie for uh, the wonderful conversation and for the paper. And uh, we will resume. Uh, for our uh, final talk of the conference uh, at uh, 1240. Thank you.
Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, glad to, uh, you could join us for our last session of the day. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Brent Caius, um, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry, Adjunct Professor in the Program of Medical Ethics and Humanities in the Department of uh, Internal Medicine, and Adjunct Professor in the Department of Philosophy at University of Utah. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Caius for joining us today to talk about the film Minority Report. Uh, it's a really great movie. Uh, you know, uh, maybe they could have cast someone instead of Tom Cruise. It might have been better. Not so sure. Anyway, thank you again for uh, joining us today for the conference break. Dan, thanks so much. And um, thanks to both you and Gary for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here. I am a little bit upset because you stole my joke about Tom Cruise. Um, but we'll come back to that. And I, I'm actually going to say very little about the film. Uh, what I am going to talk about is how we should think about the use of big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning to predict suicide. And I'm coming at this topic as a clinician who takes care of people who are at risk of suicide as a parent who has uh, children where I worry about their mental health, as uh, an ethicist, and as someone who is um, engaged in suicide prevention research, because um, I do work here with the Safe UT Crisis Text Messaging Program, and uh, we're very interested in ways that we can better prevent youth suicide. So no conflicts of interest, and I just want to uh, say that none of the things that I'm going to say are necessarily endorsed by any of the people who pay my salary. So quick outline of what I'm going to try to do. And I, I should acknowledge that, um, you know, there are multiple pieces to this. It's about 40% ethics. It's about 40% suicide prevention science. Um, it's uh, a fair amount of math, and there might be way too much material here to actually try to accomplish in about 45 minutes. So this is rather exploratory. But I'm going to start by talking about how good we are at preventing suicide right now and how good we are at predicting suicide. Then I'm going to raise a question about how we could get better uh, and explore the possible contributions of what we could just call big data, and then raise those ethical questions. Is big data suicide prediction something that we should actually want for ourselves and for our communities? And I think the answer is probably, at least right now, no. So I'm gonna start with a case um, that I think really captures a lot of the tensions that I feel in thinking about this issue. And this is a case with which I, I regret I was personally familiar. So Will was a 13 year old boy. He was a smart kid and he was very well liked. He was doing very well in school, he was very athletic, he had a girlfriend, he had lots of hobbies, lots of friends, he didn't use drugs, he wasn't violent, he had nice parents who were loving, spiritual, and not abusive, he had two younger siblings and had nice relationships with them. Unfortunately, he struggled with depression. He had been treated by his pediatrician initially and then by a child psychiatrist and a therapist. Uh, and the issue was that he often felt overwhelmed by his own perceived inadequacies. So he sometimes thought that it would be better if he would die than actually run the risk of failing in life. So he was a high achiever constitutively. So he had expressed suicidal thoughts to his parents and providers, but he never actually engaged in any suicidal behavior. With all the treatment he was getting, Will seemed to be doing better. He was happier. He wasn't talking about hating himself or feeling inadequate. His parents were still concerned, understandably. So they did things like safety proofing their house, getting rid of the handgun that they owned, locking up all of the medications. They were keeping a really close eye on him and actually tracking his location through his cell phone and picking him up every day after school to make sure that he came home and was in a safe environment. And they were basically on 24 seven suicide watch. So they were with him, one of them was when he wasn't in school or elsewhere. 
One Tuesday last May, um, Will had a seemingly pleasant day at school. He was laughing with friends. He was playing basketball in the gym, holding hands with his girlfriend at lunch, even won a math competition. Everybody who saw him that day in retrospect said that he seemed like he was doing really well. Unfortunately, that afternoon, he put his backpack and his cell phone in his locker so that his parents would not know what he was doing. He left school 30 minutes early, just skipping class um, so that they wouldn't be there. And uh, he went down to a freeway overpass and shortly thereafter died of suicide. So for everybody who knew Will, this was shocking. It seemed like his suicidal thoughts and mood were improving. His parents were doing absolutely everything they could. At no point in his care did he seem to meet criteria for hospitalization. And really, there were no outward indications on the day of his death that he was unwell. For me, this raises a lot of questions, but the most important ones are, what could we have done differently? How could we have prevented Will's death? How could we have even predicted it? And I wish that I would have some answers to these questions by the end of this talk, but unfortunately, I don't think I will. So Gary has already said a little about this, but I, I want to illustrate the scope of the problem with suicide prevention at least a little bit. Um, currently, there are over 47,000 suicide deaths each year in the United States. Rates have increased roughly 33% since the year 2000. We are trying hard to prevent suicide, but by many measures, it doesn't seem like our efforts are paying off. So I'm showing you here uh, both the amount of money in inflation adjusted dollars that we're spending per capita on mental health care in this country, it's gone up quite a bit since the early 2000s, and yet the suicide rate is also increasing, except for that, that small reduction in suicide rates the last couple of years, and uh, it remains to be seen whether that reduction is sustained. One way we often clinically try to approach suicide prevention and suicide prediction is by thinking about the antecedents of suicide, suicidal ideation, suicidal behaviors like suicide attempts, um, because those often prefigure suicide death. If you look at the statistics, suicidal ideation is actually relatively common. So uh, these are 2014 to, or 2009 to 2014 data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And uh, here it looked like 6.9% of young adults age 18 to 25 had experienced suicidal ideation in the previous year. That's less common as we get to older age groups, but still a substantial minority of people in the country are having suicidal thoughts in any given year. Suicidal behavior is less common for that 18 to 25 age group. The previous year, suicidal behavior risk was about 1.2%. And again, it's less common in older age groups. And then when we look at suicide death, we find that um, it is actually quite uncommon compared to those antecedents. So even in the age groups where it's most common, um, it's typically age 45 to 64, the age group I'm in right now, uh, we have about 19.5 persons per 100,000 who die of suicide on an annual basis, and it's relatively uncommon in that younger age group. So just to kind of summarize those figures, if we think about young adults in particular, where we have pretty good data, about one in 17 has suicidal ideation in a given year, about one in 100 engages in serious suicidal behavior in a given year, and only about one in 10,000 dies of suicide in any given year, which is in some respects encouraging. I highlight these numbers not only to illustrate the scope of the problem, but also to demonstrate how using markers like suicidal ideation or even suicidal behavior to predict who's going to die of suicide may not be very helpful.
because a small minority of people who have suicidal ideation will actually go on in any given year to die of suicide. There are other ways of thinking about this problem. Psychiatrists and psychologists have conducted psychological autopsies looking at the behaviors and thoughts and writings of people who have died of suicide. And one thing that they have observed in these psychological autopsies is that overall, and this includes both uh, children, uh, teens, and adults, only about 40% of people who die of suicide had previously engaged in any kind of suicidal behavior, which means, of course, that 60% of people who die uh, of suicide had not had a previous suicide attempt. In teens, it's actually worse. So there, about 70% die after their first known episode of suicidal behavior, or their first suicide attempt. And of course, it's quite possible for someone to engage in suicidal behavior without really previously having experienced suicidal ideation, at least not having endorsed suicidal ideation to family members or a clinician, because the progress from suicidal ideation to attempt to death can actually occur quite rapidly. It has been hoped that we could detect suicide by uh, using the existing system of care to identify people who are at risk. Um, and it's been observed that about 70% of all individuals who die of suicide have had contact with a primary care physician or a mental health provider, usually a primary care physician, within a month of their dying. But that means that about 30% of people who die of suicide haven't. And if we think about contact with the mental health care system, it's actually worse. About 50% of people who die of suicide have not really had meaningful contact with the mental health care system. So there's a huge swath of people who are dying of suicide who really aren't coming to clinical attention in any meaningful way. We've been doing some work here at the University of Utah uh, using natural language processing to try to identify who's at risk of suicide and things that predict whether someone dies of suicide. And in Utah, we have a state office of the medical examiner. So we have statewide records about suicide death. And we've looked at the medical records for over 2000 people who've died of suicide. And only about 45% of that group were positive in our medical records for any lifetime suicidal behavior or suicidal ideation. Again, it seems like many people who die of suicide aren't coming to clinical attention in a useful way, a way that would allow us to intercede. And just to emphasize that a little bit more, when we looked at the difference between people who were um, suicide decedents and had engaged in previous suicidal behavior as recorded in their medical record versus people who died of suicide without having any previous evidence of suicidal behavior, there were really stark differences. Those who had previous suicidal behavior tended to be women, they tended to have many different mental health diagnoses. They tended to have many more medical encounters and in fact, far more medical encounters than would be the mean for people in our hospital system. Uh, and they tended to die of overdose. Those who'd not engaged in previous suicidal behavior uh, tended to be men. They tended to have no known medical or mental health diagnoses. Uh, and they often had very few, and in many cases, no previous medical encounters. And then, of course, as you would expect, many of them died from uh, gunshot wounds. So just to summarize what I take to be the problem of identifying those who are at risk of suicide, it's difficult to predict suicide even in people who have come to clinical attention. But the problem's worse than that because roughly 50% of people who die of suicide do so without any warning. So we might think that there are two predictive challenges if we're in the business of trying to predict who is going to die of suicide. There's predicting suicide in the 50% of people who are seeking care, who have reported suicidal ideation, who have a known mental health disorder, who have engaged in previous suicidal behavior. Let's call that the clinical prediction problem. But there's also the population prediction problem. That's predicting suicide in that roughly 50% of people who don't seek care, who don't have any reported suicidal ideation, who have not had a mental health diagnosis, and who are not known to have engaged in previous suicidal behavior. <laughs> 
So what do we do? Well, I think the hope has been that we can use more and better data to predict suicide death, and that will enable us to target prevention measures within clinical populations and within the population as a whole to capture that 50% of people who aren't really meaningfully engaged with clinical services. I'm gonna segue a little bit and talk about how we actually prevent suicide. And you've heard a bit about this already, but I wanna strengthen some of those points. We could think of methods of preventing suicide as functioning both at a population level or being targeted at a population level and at an individual level. So at the population level, there are a few things that are evidence-based. Means restriction is the most powerful and probably the best supported in the clinical literature. Michael talked about reducing access to pesticides. That has been proven to be effective in many countries. I think in Sri Lanka, the overall reduction in suicide deaths was about 70% when they uh, restricted access to pesticides. Reducing access to acetaminophen so that you can't get huge bottles of Tylenol at Costco, but have to pop it out of bubble packs, and thus it takes more work to ingest large amounts of acetaminophen, a common method of overdose. Reducing access to firearms, of course, although as we have heard, there are very significant policy barriers to doing that, especially in the United States. Possibly firearm safe storage. People have suggested that responsible media coverage is a way of reducing firearm death because of uh, suicide contagion. Uh, and it's been shown that education measures for youth, especially within the school systems, can reduce suicide, at least in some areas. It's a little bit harder at the individual level where we started to think that someone might be at risk of suicide. Again, means restriction is evidence-based. If you take away someone's firearm, you're gonna reduce the risk that they are going to die of um, self-inflicted gunshot wound. There's suggestive evidence that certain kinds of psychotherapy, especially cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy will reduce an individual's risk of suicide death. Safety planning interventions and telephone check-ins where someone is called by a nurse or an MA just to see how they're doing after they've been in contact with the healthcare system. And of course, as a psychiatrist, I do these things all the time uh, using pharmacotherapy to reduce suicidal ideation. There's actually not great evidence that that's terribly helpful with a few exceptions. Uh, there's early evidence that ketamine can reduce suicidal ideation and therefore potentially suicide risk. Lithium seems to be associated with the reduction of suicide death in persons with bipolar disorder and clozapine for persons who have schizophrenia. Crisis lines are a big part of our national effort to reduce suicide. 988 has already been mentioned. And uh, there is possibly some evidence that access to crisis lines can reduce suicide deaths. Although a recent paper published by Candula et al. suggested that there wasn't really any clear association between the intensity of crisis line use across a state and its overall suicide mortality. There were some states that had very high crisis line use and uh, very low suicide death. There were some states that had relatively high crisis line use and high suicide death, and somewhere it was so variable that it was hard to see any kind of association. We just got these results from uh, my research work with the Safe UT program, and they're kind of exciting, so I wanted to share them. Uh, so Safe UT is a crisis text messaging app that's marketed to teens across the state through the school system. It was implemented in July of 2017, and we thought that it would be uh, important to see whether it has had an effect on key suicide-related outcomes across the state. So I just gathered data from the Utah Population Database to look at uh, teens who are showing up in ERs with suicidal ideation. And for the five years prior to the implementation of um, Safe UT, those rates increased gradually. But uh, the red line shows that once Safe UT was available across the state, there was a statistically significant increase in the number of teens who were appearing in emergency departments for suicidal ideation. That seems a little bit worrisome. But when you pair it with this, 
it might actually suggest that we're having a really powerful effect. So here we're looking at the number of teens and young adults who are appearing in emergency departments after a non-lethal suicide attempt. And after the implementation of safe UT, there was a very clear and statistically significant reduction in, um, in those visits uh, compared to the period before Safe UT was available. To me, this suggests that Safe UT might be taking people who have suicidal ideation, encouraging them to seek treatment through emergency departments and other means, and then preventing suicide attempts and, and possibly saving lives. I think this is a very tantalizing finding. So there might be some things we can do to reduce the risk of suicide both at a population level and at an individual level. There are lots of other things that we do that I think are not evidence-based at all, and I myself do them frequently. Um, these would include things like outpatient commitment to treatment, day treatment programs, partial hospitalization, both voluntary and involuntary hospitalization, residential treatment programs, which are uh, very expensive for many patients, and even things like 24-7 monitoring by family members. So ultimately, I'm going to wonder whether these measures are things that we should actually continue doing, given the limited evidence that they're beneficial and some of the other limitations we have that we face in trying to predict who's at risk of suicide. I just want to acknowledge, although this has already been mentioned, that involuntary psychiatric hospitalization and hospitalization for suicide risk themselves are very controversial uh, because some have claimed that involuntary hospitalization in particular increases the risk of suicide, potentially by reducing the agency of persons who are hospitalized or inflicting trauma on them, although I think the evidence about that is uh, very mixed. So. One thing that we need to figure out when we're trying to decide how to prevent suicide, whether we can prevent suicide, is whether we can predict it in a, any kind of meaningful way. I think the operative questions are, is it possible to predict suicide well enough so that we can use prevention measures effectively? We also need to ask, can we solve both the clinical prediction problem and the population prediction problem, because I think both are necessary to really reduce suicide optimally. How do we predict suicide now? Well, the state of the art is not very artful. It's mostly clinical judgment. So someone comes into an emergency department or a psychiatric hospital reporting depression or other symptoms, and we ask them about whether they have suicidal ideation, whether they have previously engaged in suicidal behavior, and then the clinician makes a judgment about that. There is, to my knowledge, minimal evidence that this works. So we have really no idea how good we are at predicting suicide as clinicians. Many researchers have tried to formalize this process by developing risk scales like the Beck Suicide Intent Scale, or more famously, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. And you might think that those improve things. It's not actually clear that they do. The Columbia scale has a sensitivity and a specificity of 0.67 and 0.76, respectively. And that's for uh, any kind of suicidal behavior, not just suicide death. And that's only for a very narrow period of about two months. And that's only for clinical populations of so people who are already at high risk. Also, the strongest predictive element of the Columbia scale is just having a history of suicidal behavior, which is something most clinicians would ask about and factor into their judgment. So again, it's not clear that these formal scales make suicide risk prediction better. In a review of 52 risk scales, Carter and colleagues recently determined that the overall positive predictive value of a high risk designation was only about 5.5% for any subsequent suicidal behavior. And again, in a clinical sample, people who are already at high risk of suicide. So the upshot of this is that designating somebody as high risk on any kind of risk scale only gives you about a 5.5% ability to detect people who are at actual high risk. 
The solution to this, of course, is to uh, use big data and advanced computer analytic techniques so that we can do a better job at measuring risk factors and incorporating those risk factors into predictive models. And there are lots of different approaches to this. Many of them, of course, use machine learning. Um, there are other statistical techniques like logistic regression that have been used previously. This very complicated slide just summarizes some of the recent evidence about this. It looks at a bunch of different models and different attempts to predict suicide death using different kinds of machine learning approaches. I won't get into the details about those approaches. This is just to emphasize that overall, these models do okay. We measure the performance of predictive models using the receiver operating characteristic area under the curve, or AUC. That's a kind of hybrid measure of both sensitivity and specificity. And for most of these models, the area under the curve is about 0 0.8. Not great, but not bad. In theory, these models could do a lot better than they are currently able to do because they're limited in a number of ways. One very important limitation is the information that they're able to include. Most of the models on that previous slide are based primarily on an analysis of healthcare records, often using things like natural language processing to extract risk factors from the medical record. Another limitation is that whatever records or source of information you have, they may not contain all of the data about individual characteristics that are relevant to predicting suicide. There are worries about the accuracy of the data that is contained in those records. And I think another underappreciated problem is that suicide prediction is very context dependent. So if we look at what was happening with people who died of suicide 10 years ago, we're going to identify risk factors that were operative 10 years ago. But those may not actually be the same as risk factors right now because of changes in our culture. And I think this probably goes without saying, but suicide is different across different sorts of demographics. The suicide death of an 80-year-old man with metastatic prostate cancer may not have the same sort of psychological underpinnings or risk factors as the suicide death of a 16-year-old girl who's been watching 13 Reasons Why. Given all of those limitations, the hope is that we just need to amp up the models, use more computing power and more data to do a better job of suicide risk prediction. And there are lots of proposals about how these things could be enhanced. We could take physiological tracking data from smartwatches and smartphones, looking at people's sleep hours, how much they're moving around and outside of their houses. We could measure inflammation. We could use smartphones and other techniques to track facial expression, which can give you early information about a person's emotional state. You can do the same thing with voice recognition technology. We could, as Michael mentioned earlier, take data from social media and make a suicide risk prediction on those grounds. We could use ecological momentary assessment, asking people questions via their smartphone or a computer about how they're doing. We could enhance our EMRs so that they collect more information that's pertinent to suicide risk by, say, asking people about suicide risk factors on a regular basis and recording those in a reliable way. We could use uh, genetic sequencing and transcriptomic data to get a sense of person's other underlying biological risk factors for suicide. I'll just mention very briefly. Uh, Many of my colleagues at the University of Utah have been involved in um, figuring out genetic predictors of suicide risk using data from Utah, especially uh, my colleague Anna Doherty. And uh, what they found is that uh, there are genes that are associated with increased suicide risk, at least in a European um, ancestry sample. Um, and the genes that are involved are often related to things like neuronal development, inflammation, cell energy balance, if you take all of that genetic data, it gives you the possibility of developing genetic risk score, something called a polygenic risk score that estimates the genetic contribution to a person's suicide risk and gives you a sense of how their risk compares to the population given all of those rare variants in their genome. 
And I think in, in theory, that approach could be adapted to the transcriptome, the metabolome, the methylome, all of the ohms that you might want. So just to summarize, the tantalizing promise of suicide prediction science is that if we have improved models, more data, multiple types of data, that we will get better at predicting suicide, allowing us to identify both persons who have come to clinical attention who are at risk of dying of suicide, and potentially even persons out in the population who are not engaged with medicine who are at risk of suicide. So here's the question. If we can do that, is it something we should do? Is it something that we should want? I'm just going to mention briefly that when we think about artificial intelligence and machine learning and healthcare, people raise a variety of ethical concerns. Uh, and I think it's important to acknowledge these concerns, at least in passing. There are concerns about equity. So predictive models perform best in populations whose data was used to train them. And if you have a data set that is very biased towards, say, one ethnicity, um, one race, Caucasian people, then it's not necessarily going to perform as well for other groups. That raises concerns both about a disproportionate risk of harm for minoritized and underrepresented groups and potentially about unequal distributions of benefits so that a model might actually be better at helping people who are already relatively well advantaged. I think that that's a soluble problem if we can get the right data, although getting that data is a challenge. And uh, some of my colleagues here again, Dr. Doherty and others, are actively working to develop uh, genome-wide association data sets that represent uh, non-Caucasian, non-European ancestry people with a view towards being uh, better able to identify suicide risk in different groups. There are worries about privacy with respect to data access. Um, fortunately, most of the work that is done with respect to developing suicide prediction algorithms uses rigorously anonymized data. So model development isn't necessarily a huge privacy problem, but I think, and as Michael has already somewhat illustrated, model implementation definitely threatens to impinge upon people's privacy especially if we're using it outside of ordinary clinical settings. There are also worries about responsibility. If we use artificial intelligence to predict an outcome like suicide, who's responsible for bad outcomes? What do we do if our suicide prediction model predicts suicide in somebody who wasn't really at risk, and then they're exposed to all the harms of engaging with healthcare? Conversely, who's responsible legally, morally, if the model fails to predict suicide in someone who then makes a serious or lethal suicide attempt. I'm going to focus on a slightly different question, however. And again, that question is, should we use population level models to predict suicide in persons who have not come to any clinical attention? And what I'm ultimately going to claim is that we shouldn't deploy suicide risk prediction models at the population level even if they perform extremely well, even if they perform as well as we could want them to do. And instead, what we should do is just focus on evidence-based population level prevention that is not predicated on risk prediction at all. Quick point about how to think about the characteristics of models, because unfortunately, I'm going to do a little bit of math with you. We can evaluate models both with respect to the kind of probability prediction they give us. Typically, they calculate the probability of suicide based on known risk factors and then use a threshold of probability to determine caseness. They also typically function with respect to a time horizon. Most extant models in the literature think about the risk of suicide three to 12 months after the end of data collection and aren't able to think about more narrow time horizons, like say within a week, uh, because there's just not data that is relevant to that. And likewise, aren't able to think about much more distant time horizons um, because all of the variables that are relevant to predicting suicide at that point have probably changed. It's very hard to say whether I'm gonna be at risk of suicide 20 years from now because things are gonna be so different in my life. So think now about 
four models we might want to employ to predict who is at risk of suicide at a population level, right? With a, with a goal of capturing that 50% of people who don't come to clinical attention. We can think of these models as sort of extreme cases on two axes. One axis is the time horizon. The other axis is how well these models perform with respect to their specificity. Specificity is basically how good or how reliable a positive prediction is in detecting a true positive case. So we could have a model that is moderately good at predicting suicide over a relatively long time horizon, like the next year. Moderately good here means a specificity of 0 0.8, which is comparable to what current state-of-the-art machine learning approaches can achieve. We could have a moderately good model that thinks about suicide prediction over the next week. We could have a very good model that has a specificity of 99% or 0 0.99 that works over a year-long basis. And perhaps the holy grail of suicide prediction would be a model that has a very high specific specificity of 0 0.99, but is able to predict who's going to die of suicide within a very narrow period, like over the next week again. So let's imagine that we have a moderately good model. So it has a specificity of 0 0.8, and we'll just grant that it has a sensitivity of 99%. Let's assume that the annual suicide rate across the country is roughly 10 per 100,000 people. That's about the average right now. So that's 0.01% of people each year. Let's imagine that we have a hospital system that wants to implement this model, and it serves roughly a million people in the community. Not all of them are actually patients. So 100 of those people, given the suicide rate, will die in the next year of suicide. If we use the moderately good model once each year, it's going to identify 99% of the people who die of suicide. So we'll have 99 true positives. But the downside is we're going to have almost 200,000 false positives. That means that any positive test, anytime the model tells us that someone is at very high risk of suicide, it's 2,000 times more likely that they will not die of suicide than that they will. And statisticians think about this often in terms of positive predictive value. So here, the positive predictive value of our model is only 0.05%. Not very good. So you might think, um, well, I'll come back to the short-term model when it performs well in a moment. But let's imagine that we're actually trying to figure out how to prevent suicide with this moderately good model. If our positive predictive value is only 0.05% per year, I think this means that we should absolutely do low cost, low burden interventions like lethal means restriction, like safety planning, like school education. But the thing is, the justification of those interventions is not predicated on the model at all. Those are things that we should be doing anyway. And other interventions that are more targeted at individuals who are deemed high risk are probably not justifiable because the risk of harm is not going to be justified um, by the potential benefit given the unlikeliness that those persons would die. What if we had a really, really good short-term model, right? The holy grail case. So again, this model would have a sensitivity and a specificity both of 99%, which is currently far from anything we're able to achieve. So if we're using this on a weekly basis, we would expect that there are going to be about two suicides in our population every week. If we use that model weekly, then we're gonna capture almost all of the people who would otherwise die of suicide. But again, the risk of false positives is quite high. So we'll have about 10,000 false positives every week. And that means that any positive test is 5,000 times more likely to be a false positive than it is to be a true positive. Here, the positive predictive value is only 0.02%. Even if the model was used on a yearly basis, the positive predictive value wouldn't be that much better. It would only be about 1% at that point, improved but not good enough. And if the model was 10 times better, 10 times more specific, specific than 
uh, I'm imagining the positive predictive value would only be about 10% over a year. So again, uh, only one out of 10 people that was identified as being at high risk would actually be at risk of dying of suicide in the coming year. So I think it should be clear from this that the case for using even very, very good models is going to be very, very poor. You might object, look, if the state of the art is just clinical judgment, surely we should use these models anyway, um, because although we don't know the positive predictive value for current clinical approaches, we can assume that it's extremely bad, right? Machine learning models are almost always smarter than psychiatrists. So I think that's actually probably not true. Um, and that's because there are really salient differences between what we do clinically now and population level prediction. And those differences are that most people who receive a suicide risk score or any kind of suicide evaluation currently are somehow seeking treatment and also believe that they are ill. And secondarily, most people who receive a suicide risk score also currently experience suicidal ideation so that the risk that they're actually going to have a bad outcome is much higher. So there may be a compromise that we should explore, and that's what we could call AI over the shoulder, right? Where we integrate machine learning approaches in the clinical setting. I think if suicide risk prediction modeling is likely to be justifiable, it will be in those settings, things like primary care visits for depression or anxiety, ER visits for any reason, mental health specialty visits. And the reason for that is that the risk of suicide in those populations is going to be potentially sufficiently enhanced that the false positives in the model will ultimately be outweighed by the true positives. Although that I think remains to be seen. One thing that we might conclude from this previous analysis with respect to what we do right now is that we probably shouldn't be engaging in involuntary hospitalization for patients we deem to be at high risk of suicide. And I, I have to say that this was a, a somewhat shocking conclusion for me as I was thinking through this material. So surely suicide prediction now is just absolutely rife with false positives. Most of the time when we think that someone is at high risk, they are not going to die of suicide, at least not in um, the period surrounding a hospitalization potentially. And that means that uh, when we involuntarily hospitalize people, we're almost always doing so without great justification, at least not great statistical justification. I think the one exception here is that when a patient is clearly saying that they will, that they're planning and intending to, engage in suicidal behavior if released from the hospital and also demanding to leave the hospital, then the probability that they will engage in suicidal behavior is probably sufficiently high. You might think that consent would mitigate some of the problems with population modeling. Maybe we could create this model and have everybody in our million person community opt in. And if they opt in, then they're sort of knowingly accepting the risk of harm, the risk of false positives, making it okay for us to implement the model. The problem with that suggestion, however, is that there's clearly an inverse relationship between the predictive utility of our model and whether it is limited by consent, because the people who are most likely to die of suicide in our community are probably least likely to consent to participate. Accordingly, we wouldn't really be able to capture all of the people, that 50% of people who die of suicide without coming to clinical attention. There are other kinds of harms we should worry about when implementing these models. Some of these were suggested by our group's work on genetic testing for suicide risk. So we've done surveys and interviews of uh, family members who have lost someone to suicide and people who have survived their own suicide attempt. Uh, and we wanted to know whether they would be interested in getting a genetic risk score for suicide death. While many of them identified things about that that would be positive and potentially helpful, they also identified a lot of concerns, like increased self-stigma, increased self-fulfilling prophecies, where if they thought that they were at risk of suicide, they would cease to engage in health-promoting activities. Some said that they would lose hope 
very poignantly, one of our participants said, if I had known this, I would have pulled the trigger. I would have said, I'm done. There are, of course, um, the usual kinds of worries about discrimination. And also, I think very saliently, helicopter parenting. So um, parents would be paying too much attention to what their kids are doing because they were afraid that they were at risk of suicide. This has already been emphasized today, but I think the other issue about an overzealous model is that it would create huge invasions of privacy potentially and associated potential limitations on liberty. This would depend a lot on how we approach suicide prevention and people who are predicted to be at high risk, but I think we'd be very tempted to do things like mandate psychiatric evaluations, mandate hospitalization, mandate treatment, limit people's access to means like firearms, prescription medications, um, over-the-counter medications, maybe take away their driver's licenses, all with a view towards saving their lives. And given the high rate of expected false positives, most of the time those interventions would be not justified. So in the extreme case, we might imagine that we had a suicide prediction model that performed very, very well so that it would mitigate a lot of the problem with false positives that I mentioned before. Uh, you could even imagine a model that is sort of like the Minority Report movie. It's actually a great novella by Philip K. Dick. Uh, in, in the movie and in the, the novella, uh, it's possible to predict whether someone is going to commit a crime often before they know that they're going to do it themselves. And Tom Cruise plays basically a police officer who is tasked with preventing those crimes before they happen. It's conceivable that with the right kind of data, you could have a suicide prediction model that could tell that a person is at high risk of suicide even prior to him experiencing suicidal ideation or any other relevant symptoms, perhaps even if he wasn't depressed. I think that most of us would balk at the implementation of that kind of model because it would be severely alienating. We don't want to be told that we're likely to do something if we don't actually intend already to do it. And that's what makes the minority report prediction in the movie so uncanny, this awful sense that a computer system could know me better than I know myself. I think what this shows is that there are very clear trade-offs between preventing suicide deaths and protecting people's autonomy and respecting their individual liberty. That's already true, but those risks would be intensified if suicide prediction models were implemented. So to wrap things up, if we were to implement suicide prediction models, especially at the population level, but also at the clinical level, it's very clear that we need more effective interventions that are more accessible, that are less punitive and aversive, that are less costly, that are less stigmatizing. I think it's also clear that in many respects, current interventions are good enough, or at least would be a lot better if we bothered to use them. As I emphasized earlier, we have multiple population level and individual methods of pre preventing suicide that don't actually rely on risk prediction, like restricting access to lethal means. And I think our suicide prevention efforts should focus solely or primarily on promoting those. At the end of the day, we shouldn't expect a technical fix, a technological fix for a complicated problem when the solution is just hard work and making some tough choices, especially tough choices about policy. So that's the end. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge my collaborators and um, funding support. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the very uh, fascinating uh, talk, uh, Brent. That you've raised a lot of uh, Im important uh, issues. That uh, yeah, I'm just checking the chat and Q and A now uh, to wait for comments to come in. Um, 
Dan, I, I, I'll go back to a, a, a comment from earlier in Brent's talk, but I think it's worth highlighting it. Brent, can you say more about risk factors and their either their benefit or their lack of benefit? And I'm going to invoke the mantra that I was trained with is that we don't assess risk to predict. We assess risk to identify modifiable risk factors for suicide that could be intervened upon, typically in the service of treating the person's mental illness. Let's just take depression as a case. So I understand the limitations of risk factors. And as the person mentioned, the potential um, change in those risk factors over time, both at an individual level and at a societal level. But it seems to me we still have some value if we stay in our lane and think about what we're actually going to do with these risk factors. And I'm putting to the side for a moment involuntary commitment. I'm thinking more about trading on a therapeutic alliance and working with a person around safety planning, which, as you point out, often is going to uh, involve limitation of means. And, and I'll stop there. It's both my thoughts and the person who put the comment in. It's a great question. So I, I certainly wouldn't say that we should stop doing anything that is geared towards reducing an individual patient's suicide risk. Um, I'm still going to be treating depression. I'm still going to be counseling my patients to reduce their consumption of alcohol or illegal drugs. Uh, I'm still going to be engaging them and finding reasons to live. Uh, I was trained the same way as you. So um, in, in theory, we're not actually in the business of predicting risk. We're just in the business of identifying modifiable factors. But in practice, we often are actually engaged in the business of predicting risk, right? Because uh, every single day that I'm on service in the hospital, I have somebody who seems to be maybe at risk of suicide because they're here, right? They have depression. They've had suicidal ideation before. And I have to make tough calls about whether to let them leave, uh, whether they're ready to go, um, what kind of follow-up they should get, what kind of interventions I should offer to them. And fundamentally, all of those questions are predicated on an assessment about the risk benefit of my interventions, which depends on an assessment of how likely they are to die of suicide. Now, a lot of the interventions that we might offer are justified in other terms. So if I treat depression, I might be reducing suicide risk, but I'm also helping somebody by reducing depressive symptoms, which presumably they don't want. Um, so although we like to think that we could stop assessing risk, that we don't necessarily have to do that, I don't think we can escape it. I agree with you, doctor. Uh, the next question involves the issue of social determinants of health and their role, and this I think Marie alluded to as well, uh, around their role both in predicting suicide, but also in identifying risk factors. So housing, uh, uh, food insecurity, uh, income, et cetera. Uh, would those be more helpful? I think they're more in the clinical realm than they used to be. I don't know that they've, at least at UNC, I don't know that we're using them directly around suicide risk assessment or a prediction. So I, I guess I would say that to the extent that there are modifiable social determinants of health that seem to be associated with suicide risk, we should think about addressing them at the population level, again, in a fashion that is independent of risk assessment. If we can manage to provide housing for more people, and that is a way of reducing population level suicide deaths, we should absolutely do it. Again, though, that's something we should probably be doing anyway, right, for reasons of equity and, and justice. And now we'll go over to Marie. Thanks, Brent. This was really interesting. Um, I, I have a question about the, the distinction between the clinical population, the clinical prediction and the population prediction, right? So you see, if I understand correctly, you see there is, there is a, 
stronger case for the for using for doing the clinical prediction than there is right for the population level. So, but going back to your one of your earlier slides where you drew that distinction and the clinical level, uh, clinical population were women and they tend to use less violent means, and then the other one tend to be men who use violent means. I wonder though whether it's justified to think um, that there is a stronger presumption against the latter, because if you're gonna use, uh, setting the consent issues aside, if you're gonna um, use it in the clinical population and not in the other one, and knowing that that clinical population actually, actually is less likely to die uh, on a short term, right? They might after repeated attempts, right? Aren't you, I mean, wouldn't one be worried that there might they might be more likely to um, be on the receiving end of the harm of right having interventions be based on that prediction um, and and that ultimately might not be as effective actually because you're not targeting the one that you would want to uh, target in terms of reducing suicide if that's what you're taking so I I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the risk benefit here um, well why really there is such a strong case against using it in the other one. So uh, I, I think I agree with you. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that suicide risk prediction modeling in clinical populations is going to get us where we want to be either. Uh, I didn't I didn't go through the calculations, but you know, um, because it's it's actually a little bit harder to know what the the risk of suicide in a clinical population is overall. Um, but my guess is that even the best performing models aren't going to do a very good job in those groups. My point was just that if we are ever going to use those models, it will probably be in the clinical setting first, that they actually have performance characteristics that are suitably um, suitably good. Your point about the risks of iatrogenesis in that clinical population is really well taken. So uh, again, I think even if somebody has come to clinical attention, and even if we happen to have a suicide risk prediction model that said that they were at high risk, we have to determine what interventions to utilize based on a lot of considerations, which Michael really wonderfully illustrated, including how is this intervention going to affect their quality of life over time? Is the overall benefit of the intervention greater than the potential risk of, of harm? So hopefully that's responsive to your question. Thank you. And the next question involves uh, the relationship between the risk factors that are often identified, but the more complicated issue, it seems to me, of getting at a person's motivation, their intentions, their judgment. Uh, and I'll just read the comment that, I am concerned that a reliance on a risk factor approach will cause clinicians to neglect an action-based approach looking at these other uh, uh, issues, which requires that clinician to try to understand the person's suicidality. So I think I would share that concern. And I, I guess that is evocative of the minority report worry, right? That there's a way in which suicide risk prediction isn't related to the agency or the underlying psychology of the individual. So we just feed in a lot of risk factors, which may have nothing to do with how you're thinking. And then we make an assessment. And again, I think that would be very alienating. And, and I think the question is pointing out that it would also potentially damage the relationship between the clinician and the patient. Uh, because it would dissuade the clinician from thinking about the complex psychology of the person in question. Now, I'll back off of that a little bit, because I think that psychological risk factors are, are clearly an important part of predicting suicide and determining a person's individual level of risk. Um, you know, as a clinician, I'm sure you're aware that uh, asking people about whether they're hopeful for the future, whether they have upcoming goals and plans, all of those things suggest that they're at lower risk of suicide. So it, at the end of the day, really, really good prediction probably will still incorporate an assessment of, of people's psychology in addition to all the other things that matter. 
We well, have a follow up question if there is. Oh, yeah, if there is. Actually, um, I, I'm just going to make so, a sort of procedural announcement and we can continue the discussion. So uh, we have formally reached the end of uh, Brent's session. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation and for sparking such a great uh, conversation. Uh, now what I'd like us to do is just to kind of transition into a more general Q&A for our remaining 20 minutes together. And so, uh, you know, Marie, you can follow up with your question to Brent. And I was thinking if anyone else had any questions for any of the other panelists for things that came up earlier that you were thinking about, maybe some connections between the talks that um, may have become apparent. Um, so anyway, I thought, you know, just wanted to flag that now for the next 20 minutes, we can have a sort of general Q&A. So uh, uh, Marie, take it away. Yeah, so I, I, it occurred to me, to, um, perhaps uh, this is an addition to your to your talk and, and project. Um, perhaps the learning health system um, sort of idea could be helpful here. It seems like it would sort of tag on to sort of what the aim is of the model, which is where you want to actually use the patient data, but to, to do it in an embedded way. I mean, this is what the learning health system does where you combine, right, like practice um, and, and research. So it, it seems like perhaps, I mean, in bioethics, it's focused in, typically, as you know, I mean, not so much on, on suicide risk, but it seems like that could be sort of a, a viable way forward that takes care of some of the major worries we might have with, with um, risk assessment, but still get to actually knowing, I mean, getting a better sense of what the practice is like data-wise, right? Um, yeah. Just a follow-up thought I had. That's a good thought. And uh, I do think that for these models to get better over time, they would have to be integrated into a learning health system where the EMR is tailored to collecting the kind of data that is seemingly relevant to suicide prediction and uh, where you have a feedback loop between the EMR and the suicide prediction model so that we're changing the data that we collect while changing the predictive interface and then changing the data. I'm still skeptical that that approach is going to get us to where we want to go. I, I have a, a more general a question for anyone on the panel that would be interested. I, I, it does harken back to things that Michael talked about um, and Marie in particular. I'm thinking here about some of the criticism of the Canadian decision. And some of the criticism that I have read goes something like this. Uh, look, suicide and all this very important. Why don't you just treat people with mental illness better? and provide a higher level of service. And maybe that's the number one suicide prevention <laughs> mechanism. And so, and, and I'll even push it a little further. Some that I've seen has suggested even that it's in the interest of the state to introduce euthanasia because it's just a lot cheaper. You don't treat people and then you give them the means to kill themselves and then they kill themselves and they don't cost you any more money. So I, 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 I felt the tension during the day between a lot of our good conversation around suicide prevention, but have just begun to worry more and more about the lack of mental health services and how that actually impacts this picture. I'll stop there. Um, yeah, I'll start and maybe others want to follow. Um, yeah, I... So to the, the worry about the state wants to do this to, you know, because it's cheaper. I mean, I I don't think there is a, a conscious sort of plan to do this in order to, right, like um, solve some problems through assisted death or euthanasia, right? Um, but there is a real worry, though, that right, we might get to that, the policy itself, regardless of the intent, might get to a place where it ends up being discriminatory, right? Um, so so that is a real worry. I will say, so, of course, what you're raising actually also goes to the issue of assisted death in mental disorder specifically, and that's really sort of a different ballgame almost altogether, right? I feel like what I talked about today is sort of the basis, and then it it raises separate concerns when it comes to mental disorders. And, and in particular, I think the, 
the way to think about it is the, the irremediability thing, right? And that goes back to what I would call that hybrid model, right? Is that we can sort of be on board with that hybrid way of thinking and, and the counterfactual account of harm, right? That Michael was um, alluding to. Um, but you still have to then define, well, what do you mean by, well, in this case of someone who is not dying is, um, you know, is, um, you know, is it irremediable, right? How can you say their chances of having a good life are, to use McMahon's words, like irretrievably lost, right? And and so that's that's where the whole social justice thing comes in, because if we want to be serious about the social remedies, then, you know, that would exclude probably um, this option, right, for people, because we would first want to be serious about actually remedying like what, what Bren was saying about, well, if it's it's a minimal, then we have a duty to first do that. And if we want to be serious about that, we still have a lot of work as we've heard today, right? So um, so that would be my, my response. I'll, I'll just say, Marie, that, you know, Canada's Canada and North Carolina's North Carolina. So, uh, <laughs> and the two shall never meet. Gary, just a, a, a quick add on. So I think it's clear that implementing assisted suicide, whether it's for terminally ill persons or persons with physical illness or persons with mental illness should be accompanied by better access to effective treatment. We wouldn't feel comfortable providing assisted suicide to persons with cancer if their cancer was curable. And to the extent that people are seeking medical aid and dying because they have curable mental disorder or treatable mental disorder so that we could actually meaningfully reduce their suffering, that seems problematic. But I do wanna problematize the idea of resources a little bit. I think that um, if we increase access to mental health care, we have to do it in a way that ensures that those who are going to benefit the most from it are actually getting the resources. I'll, I'll recollect to you the slide I showed about mental health expenditure in the US per capita. It's gone up a lot. And yet we don't really seem to be making people better. Rates of depression and anxiety are higher than they have ever been. Rates of suicide really haven't started to decline. So where are those resources going? What are they actually doing? If we're going to improve access, we need to do it in a way that is truly efficacious. And I guess one fear I have is that a, a lot of the time by increasing access, we're increasing access primarily for um, what, for lack of a better term, we might call the worried well, people who are relatively less ill and also better able to utilize the system and thus not getting it where it needs to go. So. Question comes for the panel uh, about the uh, suicide crisis among youth, young adults and students. I know Amy's not with us, I don't think on the call anymore. Where does the panel think we might have any leverage points or gaps in interventions that we might be able to, uh, you know, leverage or or exploit those gaps in such a way as to improve the suicide and mental health crisis in youth? And this really maybe speaks, Brent, to your point about where are resources going and are they going to who needs them and in the right way. I don't know if others have any thoughts. Well, well, if I, uh, Brent, if you want to go ahead, uh, go ahead. But otherwise, I would respond to. I mean, I think it, this goes to the question and, and following up on what you just said. Um, I, I think we need to take into consideration that people get better recovery. Mental health doesn't depend only on the medical care they get, right? So there is the, the worry about access to mental health care, but also recognizing that when people actually do recover, they often credit, they might credit their psychiatrist, but they might credit many other things that happen in their life, right? And so that goes to the, the whole bucket of assisted suicide, but as much uh, in, in suicide prevention, I think one underutilized uh, resource in adults as well as in, in adults, as well as in youth is, is peer support, right? Sort of thinking, how can we support our students, right? Like how can we support them um, leveraging 
peer support and, and not focusing only on sort of tailored one-on-one -on -one medical attention. So I think that's one fruitful avenue. I, I was going to say almost exactly the same as Marie, um, but uh, I guess I would add, it's probably not a question of actual mental health care. It's more likely to be a matter of upstream things, primary prevention, primordial prevention, people sometimes call it. What we need to do is um, restore some of the things that historically have been protective against suicide a better sense of belonging and community, uh, uh, meaningful social relationships that aren't mediated by a, a computer screen, maybe reduced use of social media. I think the data about that and suicide risk in teens is pretty darn compelling. Um, so, you know, getting people to a point where they are engaged in relationships with others that give them a sense of having a, a connection and a reason to live probably the most powerful thing we can do to reduce suicide. And I think Brent Dent yeah. speaks to a lot of the previous comments we've seen on motivation and exploring what someone's, what's actually going on in a person if they're thinking about ending their life. We'll go to Dan. I was just going to say on this question, if I may, on, on youth suicide. Um, so I agree very much with what Brent was saying and that um, I think an underlying theme, you know, in my own work on this subject is a certain skepticism, right? That uh, suicide prevention is first and foremost, you know, a mental health problem. And I think, you know, youth suicide in particular, uh, it's difficult to uh, look at the data from the past generation or two and not ask yourself, you know, in what ways did our societies become unhealthy for youth, right? <laughs> uh, because something has, you know, a number of things have clearly changed in the lives of young people. Um, and I, you know, Brett mentioned social media and so forth, you know, relationships and that kind of thing. And one of the things that I think we have to talk about is, you know, sort of changes in, you know, expectations around, around childhood, right? I mean, and, you know, the high levels of reported stress among, you know, adolescents and pre-adolescents about you know, academic performance and, you know, uh, being admitted to universities and um, sort of all of the expectations surrounding becoming an adult, uh, probably well before many of them are, are actually, you know, prepared or interested in becoming adults and, you know, declining time associated with, with play and independence and, and unsupervised, you know, uh, activity. Uh, I mean, I think in a way, right, the youth suicide uh, movement uh, or youth suicide uh, trends have something to do with um, they're being expected to be adults, right, at, at times when uh, they're really not prepared to do so. Um, and, and the loss of, of a lot of the, I would say, sort of um, protections of childhood, right, sort of the, the more, uh, I would say, kind of carefree, joyful aspects of childhood that seem to be eroding away. Um, so in a way, right, you know, I think the answer is, uh, how do we create a healthy society for, for young people? Uh, and I think it's, you know, something has gone on, right, in the past, 30 or so years to, to erode the conditions of a healthy society for youth, so. Anne, you're up next. You want to make a comment? Yeah, I mean, um, just to build on some of the major themes of the day, I think that the practice of psychiatry and thinking about psychiatric ethics very quickly leads us to reflect on what is the structure of a just society and what is the structure of a good society? And I think that uh, these questions about the social determinants of health, access to healthcare, and so on are important and are definitely empirically a part of the issue. Uh, but then there's sort of the remaining questions about what children's hopes for the future are with threats like climate change or, uh, you know, total environmental devastation and in like within their lifetimes, perhaps. Uh, there's concerns, grounded or not, those are the concerns, you know. Uh, and also, we haven't really spoken that much about some of the uh, questions about the political structures that exist within societies, uh, specifically when it seems like the institutions are no longer protecting us from authoritarian or um, 
demagogue influence. <laughs> uh, you know, that these factors are definitely an important part of the issue as well, since, you know, this is a talk about the science, the ethics, and the policy dimensions. I wanted to point out, you know, that there's sort of underlying political uh, principles um, at play here as well, sort of, you know, protecting uh, liberty uh, in the face of um, the potential for oppression, tyrannical rule, uh, you know, so I, I just it, sort of flagging here that there are sort of also connections to some of these broader questions in political philosophy uh, that are um, sort of at, at the heart of this as well, because, you know, you can have a, a materially happy society in the short term that may have a high suicide rate because people don't have much hope for the future or they feel that they don't have any political power within the societies that they live in. And sort of related to this, and this might seem sort of out of left field, uh, but you know, um, in Michael's framework, one central piece was the notion of biological, biological welfare. And, you know, I thought that another important, uh, you know, biographical, sorry, <laughs> biographical uh, welfare, you know, and I thought an important part of that was uh, our narrative identities and thinking about the stories that people tell and that, that does a lot to shape their sense of political identity. It does a lot to shape their sense of well-being. So, you know, I, I felt that uh, that's a, sort of another dimension that could be really unpacked here to, you um, broadly explore more themes about the role of uh, how social scripts and our individual autobiographical narratives can sort of be at odds and that that could be playing a role in a lot of uh, concerns about suicide. So, um, you know, I'm just flagging or expressing a few of my reactions to themes that have come up today. I haven't had enough time to fully digest them and reflect on them. Uh, since uh, it's been a very rich conversation. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'll stop there. Well, Dan, your comments, um, you know, remind me of, of uh, Victor Frankl's observations, right? Advanced search for meaning, right? That people will tolerate, right? Huge amounts of suffering and adversity if their lives hold out promises of meaningfulness, right? And, uh, you know, he witnessed that firsthand, right? And, uh, you know, your comments about, you know, the political environment and, and, and the environment environment, <laughs> um, all of these things, I think, you know, again, going back to the youth suicide question, you know, I think that there's a kind of experience uh, among uh, youth and industrialized societies where they, where they do feel that, you know, a, a kind of crisis of, of meaningfulness, right? You know, what are they doing with their lives and why should they do any of this stuff? Um, you know, and so it's, it's, um, it's deeply spiritual, right? And I mean, you know, some of the things that, that Brett was saying just about the difficulties of predicting suicide. I mean, I think part of the difficulties, you know, when we're working at the population level is, you know, yeah, we can identify factors and then look for, you know, evidence that suggests the presence or absence of different factors and so on. But in some ways, you know, I think that there's something kind of elusive about suicidal ideation and action that has to do with this sense of, you know, meaningfulness, right? Should, should, should I continue my life, right? Do I have reasons to invest in my future? And that I don't know you know, that chat GPT or whatever is going to help us understand that or predict it or, you know, uh, get inside people's, people's, you know, psyches in, in an almost, you know, spiritual way, right, to kind of understand, you know, why some people go down this path and some people don't, so. I would, yeah, I was going to ask Brent whether I could just go on chat GPT at the end of this and ask whether I'm going to take my life in the next week and see what it would probably send. It's going to send the SWAT team to my house is what's going to happen. So I'm not going to ask it. <clears throat> I've actually tried that, Gary. And um, and what it does is say you have violated the terms of use of chat GPT. So it won't give you any answer at all. Well, that's no fun. Mm -hmm. Dan, looks like we're coming to time. We need to thank everybody. And that's what I'll do. So uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for participating in this conference today. Uh, I have found this to be a, a very uh, illuminating and uh, insightful conversation. Uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, we do hope uh, that uh, this the recording of this event 
that will live on YouTube after this uh, will get utilized as a learning resource and a tool for people to uh, explore these issues again. And I know I will revisit some of these recordings because there's a lot that I want to think about more uh, in this a very rich and um, sort of important line of inquiry about uh, science, ethics, and politics of suicide prevention. So thank you again. And 